Hello everyone, welcome to the Sega Saturn Shiro Podcast, the spookiest Sega Saturn podcast on the internet. Today we're going to be talking about the most spookiest, the most scariest, the most frightening games for the Sega Saturn. So before we get into the list and talk about our experience with these games, uh, what have you guys been up to since the last time we talked? Dave? Uh, I have been super busy at work, so that's been taking up most of my time. But I've been doing this project for uh, the Saturn archival group that I'm doing on Facebook, where I'm trying to extract and archive um, entire years of Sega.com, the old website. And right now I'm working on like the very beginning. So basically archive.com, they archive the websites and you're able to access them using their system. But there's like a, it's, it's not exactly intuitive. There's like a bar that comes down and covers half the page. And what I'm trying to do is just extract the whole thing and all the branching pages and just put it into like one easily archived website for that year so that people can search it and basically use all of the resources. And I was able to do that in Ruby. I was able to extract the entire websites but then I'm having to do some rebuilding of some of the HTML and some of the links just aren't redirecting to the right places. Um, but it's really interesting because what I found um, as I was digging in to that 96 archive of Sega.com is that there was a web comic on the Buzz page called Sherman's Lagoon. And what, what was really funny was I kind of went outside to try to archive Sherman's Lagoon so that people could basically, you know, access it through the Sega.com because I'm trying to do a complete archive. And what I found was that the old URL was S Lagoon. So just S L A G O O N S Lagoon.com. And when you type that in to archive.com for 96, what comes up is Sega, Sega's website. And so I'm starting to think that this is kind of one of those things where Sega had that URL or they own that domain, S Lagoon, and there was some kind of a legal thing between them and then the webcomic, Sherman's Lagoon. And so through some negotiating, they must have decided or agreed to include it on their page as like a webcomic. And then like in subsequent years, Sherman's Lagoon got that URL, S Lagoon, and then Sega just went to Sega.com. But yeah, check it out for yourself. If you type in slagoon.com, um, you'll see that the very first archive is actually Sega's website. So that's kind of a funny thing that I stumbled on. And um, the more that I kind of branch out and like search some of these archived paths, I'm finding some really interesting things. So that's kind of a work in progress. And I will tell you that because it uses such an old version of HTML and old HTML standards, it uses folder structures where it just assumes that if you're in a certain folder that it's going to launch the index. But that's not the case these days with modern web browsers. So I literally am having to go in and type, you know, index.html on the end of these and, and kind of fix some of the directories and stuff like that so that everything works. But it's a fun project. And in the end, I think it's going to be something that I can slap on a on Google Drive or maybe just host on the Facebook page, but be something that people can easily access. And there's a lot of resources there. That's pretty bizarre. I never knew that. Why did Sega go with S Lagoon? Why not just Sega.com? They not I have, available? I have no idea, but I kept racking my brain to try to think of like what was Sega doing in the early nineties. And I know that they had a thing in California that was like called Sega Lagoon. It was almost like um, it was almost like I know on the East Coast, Disney World had like Monsoon Lagoon. And I think there was something um, maybe one of the listeners can reach out and correct me. But there was something on the West Coast in L.A. with Universal Studios, some kind of partnership. It was like a water park and they had, you know, celebrity teens come and do like challenges and games like on TV and stuff like that to like promote Sega. And I think there was a thing called Sega Lagoon, but I'm having a hard time finding resources for it. Be away beach volleyball. Yeah, that's a little bit in the future. <laughs> well, I mean, anyway. Be away was released for the Saturn, right? Uh, it was. That is true. But the is beach this, volleyball. Is this like before that was like '92. This is this is like early Sonic. This is like back in the days when they were trying to promote Sonic Two. Oh wow! They, I didn't yeah, realize they, it went that far back. I thought it was like. Yeah. Kay, do you know anything about this? No, I actually do not know anything about Sega Lagoon. Okay. So I'm going to do some more digging and I'll probably, um, you know, I'll release whatever information I can find out. I have no idea why the entire Sega website, all of the hosted assets 
were sitting on S Lagoon in 1996. It was like early December 1996, and that's the, as far back as the web archive goes. And then suddenly on December 19th, everything switches over to Sega.com. But there's a webcomic called Sherman's Lagoon, and it redirects to slagoon.com, which after December 19th, 1996, it is definitely a webcomic, you know. So it's kind of like that King of Fighters 98 thing that you found. It's just a little weird thing that I'm... I'm kind of puzzling why that is, but you know. That sounds a lot cooler than my thing. Well, no, I mean, it's all cool. It's all history, you know? Well, this um, is very interesting stuff. I never even knew that. I mean, you could be blowing the lid off of something that was lost through the annals of time. But I um, encourage people to check it out. You know, go Sega.com into the Wayback Machine and check out that December 19th, 1996 archive. Um, and you'll see that it's very similar to the archive of the same time of S Lagoon. Yeah, and I'm looking back at slagoon.com, uh, and November 14th, 96 gives me Sega Online and this really shitty website that looks like it doesn't work. Exactly. And that's what I'm trying to do, is I'm trying to extract it, archive it, and make it work. And it's been tough, because I've had to reach out to old websites that don't exist anymore, um, old giveaways, old contests, compacts, old website. And, um, you know, I figured to do it thoroughly, I really have to archive the branching paths as well, not just the root website. But anyway, it's a project. But anyway, what, what have you been doing? Um, basically, what I've been up to, uh, we've just been playing a couple games. I started getting back into Resident Evil 2 for the holidays. Well, the October awesome. holiday. So I've been playing that. Uh, I love I love Resident Evil 2. It's the, the best Resident Evil in the series. And that's the... Is that the only one that's out so far until the remake? What, what do you mean? Uh, there, There's only one version, right? There yeah, was no there's only Resident cut. Evil 2. Okay. Well, there's a DualShock edition as well. Oh, okay. And there's a, there's a it's been re-released on like every Nintendo console ever. So, uh, But been playing a little bit of that, getting the Halloween spirit. Uh been playing, trying to play some bots again like usual, uh, Neo Geo. Uh, Mario is sitting on my shelf as of today, which is October 27th. Uh, awesome. It came in this morning. Uh, it's still in the cellophane tape. It'll cool. be played sometime. Don't know when. And uh, yeah, I've been just looking around for some Sega stuff. Kind of hard though, but you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. I mean, there's at least one new game I want to get that we mentioned before in, in the Ooh, chat. And what is that? That was the, the, the Parodius. Oh, okay, got it. I want to get that one, because that one looks sweet. Sure does. I never played any of the Parodius games, but I definitely want to try this one out. Now, I think there was uh, a copy of Parodius that the PAL territory got. They were lucky with a few different games, um, you know, like KO Flying Squadron, and they got a copy of Parodius, and they got... Uh, Deep Fear, you know they got. There's a few of those Japanese games that they got that we didn't get, so I'm a little jealous. But um, you're picking up the Japanese copy. Uh, yeah, I want the Japanese copy. The I don't know how the Power Run would run on the U.S. system. Sure. How much is that going to set you back? I didn't check yet. I just thought the game was cool, so yeah, I, I might just burn it if it's too expensive. Mm-hmm. Now, is this sexy Parodius you're going to get, or is this just Parodius? No. no. Okay. Hey. He's getting regular Parodius. Hey, I have to ask. Yeah, what, especially. What exactly is sexy that. Parodius? You tell me. Why would I know? You t- <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the, the backstory here is that no. uh, on our Discord, uh, we have an internal chat, and a picture showed up showing an octopus having a lot of fun. Very, very that, mysterious. Very picture. mysterious. And we're like, what the heck is that? And he's like, it's sexy Parodius. It's like, ah. No, I'm just getting ready to Parodius. I'm not that kind of gamer. I just thought it was really weird. I, I am that judge. kind I of wouldn't, gamer. I would not judge, you know. I um, am that kind of gamer. I have a lot of uh, yellow and red label games. In fact, I have zero. But and I have burned copies of all those. <laughs> <games>. <laughs> so I'm even dirtier. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, uh, for the most part, I've been just playing Saturn games. Uh, my Oh, I forgot to talk about the Saturn Stick project. So I want to m- move on to that next uh, uh, mod. Actually make the Sega Saturn Stick extremely good. 
from very good to extremely. Okay, this is we're talking about the Virtua stick, right? Yeah. The, okay, the so what did you one. do? The one that weighs a ton, right? Yeah, the good one. Okay, when you cool. want to get, but sure. Uh, essentially, uh, after playing with my Neo Geo stick, I've fallen in love with Sumitsu buttons, and mm -hmm. comparing it to these the Virtua stick one, they're sticky. They're very uh, clicky, clicky, and they feel very plasticky. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to uh, I wanted to actually open it up, uh, rip off the PCB that keeps the buttons on, and just replace it with all wiring and have a regular stick with it. For people who are uh, uh, asking themselves which Virtua stick he's talking about, it's the Japanese model HSS zero one three six. Yeah, the not good the one. one that yeah, not the one that we got here, which has the same title. Exactly. Uh, in Japan, that one was known as HSS zero one zero four. It's, it's so this stick, stick. It, it's yeah. built like a tank, and um, it's white, and it has like a clear, thick plastic, um, like blast cover on the top, and it it um, has colorful buttons. Correct. Yeah, it's modeled after um, Sega's candy cabs of the time, so like the right. Astro City or the Blast City. The Blast City. I have mm -hmm. to say though, the layout on the layout on the eight button is like retarded. A little bit, yeah. It, it looks like it's just a cluster of buttons compared to any other eight I've seen. But it works. You, so you so you did this mod and and uh... no, it's in progress. Oh, you're still in progress. I'm I'm playing out the my approach for it. I don't want to go in go in and just wing it. Because usually when I go in and, and wing it, stuff doesn't work and stuff breaks. And Patrick gets sure. frustrated and go and cuts corners. So mm -hmm. basically. What I was gonna do is I was gonna desolder all the buttons from the PCB, uh, desolder the wires from the PCB to the actual control module that goes from the the core the button inputs to the cord and to the system. Mm -hmm. and essentially, just replace it with with straight wires. Cool. And just daisy chain the ground connection and do all that fun stuff. It's a definitely an, it's not complicated. The only hard sounds part, like a lot of work. It's a lot of work, and the hardest part, I have to say, is desoldering the PCB off the buttons, because, mm -hmm. like, I don't know about you guys, but that's, like, my weakness when soldering is desoldering. And do you have, like, a solder sucker? Or um, I, a I have a tape? solder sucker, but I'm not good with it, but I was probably going to use the, the solder braid. Well, sure, the solder braid. The soldering okay. braid. I was going to use mm -hmm. that on it. Yeah, so it's time intensive, and you have to pay close attention to what you're doing, and... You know, you don't want to break any traces, and well, no, I can break the traces. It doesn't matter. That PCB is going to be thrown out. Oh, okay. It, it's literally just a PCB. It's like the simplest PCB ever. It's a PCB that connect that basically connects all the ground wires together, mm -hmm. and connects the wires to each of the outputs. So yeah, I was just thinking about desoldering in general. Um, but so so Patrick, for for somebody who might be interested in getting one of these sticks, um. I wanted to ask you or Kay, have either of you guys tried the ASCII stick? And what are your thoughts on that? I didn't even know ASCII came out with a stick. Yeah, it's like, uh, I think that one also came out stateside as well as... It was um, like licensed by, it was like officially licensed by Sega. Wait, is that that three button one? No. No, no they, it's like a the Fighter X. Um, it, it wasn't bad this is one of the few sticks like a few peripherals i actually don't own for the system mm -hmm. it looks like <laughs> shit it, it yeah it looks it's be it looks beefy but it looks plasticky too it, that's probably yeah. it because that stick looks like the same thing that would be on beyond the the virtual stick so the, well the us one what's well, not really this is clicky a, stick i, the, I would it, say it's a step above the first generation virtual stick okay and so. a couple of steps below the um like the Hori Fight SS. Oh yeah, that yeah. one's godlike. Yeah, the Hori SS and the Virtual Stick, you can't go wrong. Okay, but if you had a death match between them. Oh, I would hands down every single time of the fight fighting stick SS. This really? Hori knows, that, Hori knows their shit when they make stuff. So why didn't you get one of those? Because I couldn't afford it. Okay. But that's weird because I've seen a couple of them for less than what a Virtuous stick is going for. Well, the thing is, yeah. I got mine in a deal. I traded the virtual the virtual stick for a copy. I traded my Soldner X2 for Vita for mm -hmm. the stick. It was like 40 oh, okay. bucks. So. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, that's a no-brainer. 
Yeah, so that's why I went with it. If I had the horse stick and it was cheaper, I would have went with that. I'm going to rephrase my statement earlier and make mention. I, I'm talking about like the first generation, you know, crappy looking virtuous stick. When I oh, that, oh, yeah, that's what you meant. Yeah, the, that, the ASCII stick is a step above that. So we're saying that the you've got the U.S. virtuous stick, the black one. Yeah. Um, then, then you got the ASCII stick. Then you got the J Japanese virtuous stick, which was modeled after the Blast City cabs or the candy cabs, and then the Hori stands on top. Only if the um, the candy cab style stick is not modified. Once it's okay. been modified with you know better buttons, uh, I think it blows everything else away. But yeah. the build quality on those is insane. Yeah, it really is. To be honest, though, I think I think the standard stick. I think the Hori. I don't know, it's a toss-up at that point against the, the Saturn, the Virtua Stick, the Japanese one with the Simitsu Stick. Because the thing about it is that the the, the, this, the Virtua Stick, the Japanese one, came with two different sticks. It came with a, a Simitsu Stick in the first iteration and an ASCII Stick in the second. Oh, okay. So, the one you want to get is the Simitsu Stick, and the way you can tell is that it has a, a flat, a flat, rounded, smooth edge. But the ASCII Stick has like a, a pointed up... Uh, Point, like pointed things all across like these little white plastic connectors like little uh lines little things poking up but i think i know what you're saying though but yeah uh so yeah the in, in terms Let's of be that, honest though the stick to get is the dual virtuous stick where your where your opponent is sitting right next to you right oh yeah the the japanese one that one's really cool but to be that honest, one's literally modeled after like the console of a, of a candy it out, but yeah the i own two of those and I'm sure. <laughs> of course you do <laughs> of course i do right one of them is right now being used at uh salesforce in uh hillsborough for um an extra life tournament and one of them is 12 feet away from you <laughs> 16 and up in the air but um yeah they i actually had someone uh, approach me uh because I was selling one of them for a while, um, and they wanted the uh, base, the, the control panel itself, literally can drop into an Astro, um, an Astro City, and uh, they already had something like that. They wanted to, to bring in their own um, Astro City control panel for I, I might have been virtual on honestly, I don't remember, and then drop it into a uh, the the Saturn portable casing, right the. Mm -hmm. uh, outer case for that and it's it's plug and play i actually could probably i think the candy cabs a lot of them were a similar control panel like universal template so sure i could probably take one of my candy cabs control panels out and drop it into there if i wanted to wow that's cool do you know how the button quality is on there are there like Simitsu levels on the actual japanese two player or is it still the same material that's used on the single virtual stick it's still the same material. Damn it, buttons. They're, they're, they're not, not the greatest. They're not bad, but I mean, they're no, they're no Simitsu or Sanwa. They were cutting edge when they came out. Yeah. For a console, I mean, that's yeah. really like the key is that that was literally a. I mean, and I, I mean this like the actual proper word uh, use of literal. It was literally a control panel dropped into um, a casing, and they just cheaped out on the buttons a little. Right. Man, but yeah, actually, the the stick I have the uh, the one I made is actually in, based off of the Astro City layout with the the, th the four the four buttons. The the new Geo stick I have I modified. It uses mm -hmm. that real ar arcade pro body. If you want to look that up, it has like the that sort of loop to it, and it feels really good. I love the the Sega Astro the Blast City button layouts. I think personally those are like the most comfy to use because they feel natural in my hand. Mm -hmm. Compared to the Taito ones that became popular later. I don't know about how you guys feel about that as well. Yeah, I don't know. I, I just um, am happy to have some of these artifacts from the past because it's getting harder and harder to find them. And I wanted an arcade uh, cab since I was a kid. And it, I, you can make your own control panels i mean even if we wanted to for the for the saturn you have the interface boards we have the pinouts for it you can build yourself you know whatever stick you want or um 
if you are you know like i'm a fighting game enthusiast particularly for capcom titles uh so when the 360 sticks started coming out by mad cats and they had really you know increased their quality a uh, guy named toodles um put out the uh, mc cthulhu boards and they gave you the ability to plug this into a saturn and a super is this Nintendo. the same toodles that did like the scanline generator he did a, a scanline generator yeah yeah okay i know who you're talking that's about. the the what is that uh, arcade uh, forge right no, Arcade Forge is a guy. different one. Um, Toodles made a competing product uh, mm -hmm. for gotcha. cheaper. I was going to say, that'd be a weird coincidence. And then well, there's I, Crafty Mech, and that, that he does it even cheaper. Yeah, I mean, there's on the SRK forums, you know, for people who are really into competitive fighting games, um, Shoryuken.com, I think, uh, the, uh, the MC Cthulhu was pretty much the go-to um, board to modify your uh, joysticks and it was fantastic uh pretty inexpensive and i ended up buying a bunch of his boards uh specifically so that i could use my tournament edition like street fighter 4 sticks on my saturn for playing you know street fighter alpha 3 or whatever mm -hmm. but i we've gone <laughs> well, i want I, I want to hear what how k's prge oh PRGE yeah he was we got to hear about that yeah, okay. Uh, tell us about your uh, PRGE experience. What was that that whole event like? I never went there myself because I don't go to Oregon very often. So, um, well, this is the twelfth uh, PRGE, and I think it's my eleventh time attending um, in any capacity, and the third that I ran these exhibits. Um, so, uh, for those who don't know or haven't heard from the last podcast, I run the Xbox uh, LAN party or battle arena um, at uh, PRGE every year. And it's uh, located in the free play arcade area. And basically we bring out about 20 to 25 Xboxes, uh, get them networked together and play a bunch of, you know, LAN system link games. And uh, this year we also added a, an additional, um, uh, display, which is, PRG hasn't actually done before. Um, anyone familiar with you know 80s to 90s uh, console gaming, there was quite a bit of light gun action going on for a while. They've kind of fallen by the wayside, even though we have much better technology for doing light guns these days. Um, you can't play classic light gun games on an LCD television without you know significant modification and what we did for this year uh, first time was set up a couple of CRT televisions and a, a prize wheel that was used as a randomizer and we hooked up uh, four or five different consoles with a bunch of different games and the idea behind this was like showdown at the OK Corral or showdown I guess at PRGE where you and a buddy would go up uh, to the uh, display um, flip a coin to see who spins the wheel. When you spin the wheel, a random game would pop up. And then uh, our staff would go ahead and turn on that game for both televisions, and you guys would go head-to-head -head for a score attack or you know, how far you can get in the level, something like that. Um, mainly because the one thing I feared about doing a light gun display is that everyone would just want to play Duck Hunt because that's you know, yeah. the most popular gun game. And... Uh, it worked out overall. Um, I mean, PRGE is, is always a fun event, and I love doing the event. Uh, this one was very interesting. <laughs> um, the entire time, I didn't even know this, but um, directly behind my booth, in, you know, the next booth behind me, was Ben Heck uh, with a bunch of uh, uh, pinball enthusiasts. Oh, like, wow. The entire weekend. So uh, I had a surreal moment, like you know, eating ice cream uh, next to w with Ben Heck uh, while we we're discussing, you know, Saturn and other things that were going on. And I even uh, got to take a, a pic with him, which is kind of neat. Is he a me. fan anyway. of Saturn? Y you know, um, I don't know. I do mm -hmm. know that, like, um, he saw my. Uh, I didn't bring my Navi out, but I brought my normal high Saturn normal high saturn i brought the uh the oval uh button high saturn and he looked at it and just what the heck is a high saturn so i got to you know cool. talk about obscure saturn hardware with ben heck 
it was kind of nice. Yeah, me and uh, my buddy, whose birthday it is today, by the way, uh, happy birthday, Richard Yago. Uh, happy birthday, dude! Woo! Happy birthday! He uh, really held the glue together for um, our PRGE presence, and you know we're both you know kind of giddy fanboys for Ben Heck's work, and you know, just love the daylights out of things he's done. But uh, yeah, uh, Xbox Land worked out okay. Um, I sold my uh, first Rea uh, system in the PRGE auction. Cool, and that you know. Uh, that helped out a lot financially, and um, is it okay to ask what it finally went for? Yeah, uh, it's not private. It, it sold for four hundred and fifty. Wow, Shit. nice. It, it well, was there I mean, a competitive bidding, or was it just like somebody dropped that bid? No, it was a, a little competitive. I mean, it wasn't too uh, too far extravagant. Well, because I know you were saying like I don't even know if it'll sell. You know. Saturn Um, is a weird sell there. Um, I mean, like the biggest things of the night that went at that auction, um, there was like an Atari VCS uh, 2600 um, programming guide. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, And it was like like a printout, right? From like 19, I don't know, 83 or something like that. And that went for $2,600. Who bought that? Wow. This was the 40th anniversary of the Atari VCS anyway. So Okay. And... You know, Howard Scott Warshaw um, was on site and one of his uh, printouts of the source code for like Yar's Revenge uh, was on sale and that went for um, at least a grand. Wow. Uh, there was like a, a Fallout statue, like, you know, the the Pip-Boy character, I guess, or, you know, the Fallout blonde. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. Pip-Boy, that's what it is. Okay, he uh, that that character. Uh, I think it was like a four foot tall statue, um, and that went for thirty one hundred dollars. Really? Wow! When I was in San Luis Obispo just two weekends ago, there was a candy store downtown Slow, and it had a four or five foot statue of Pit Boy, like you in know, the middle. I, of the- I, I don't think I think it's Vault Boy. Vault well, boy? it's the guy. It's the guy, bl- you know, winking his eye and giving you yes. a up, right? Yeah, exactly. they had that exact statue in the middle of this candy store, and I thought it was the most bizarre thing. Oh, well, I guess that thing you can is... pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> you should be like, hey, can I buy it for fifty bucks? Oh, yeah, you'd it's, be it's, it's Vault Boy. It's Vault Boy. Okay, Vault Boy. Oh, I'm just yeah. thinking of. Okay, yeah. So, I also picked up like um, we have some pretty decent Goodwills in the area up here in the Northwest, sure. and. Uh, like a prime example, I went to uh, one in Renton, which is like a suburb or part of Seattle proper a few years ago. And uh, I picked up um, an Xbox debug kit, actually two of them, uh, for $10 each. So just to give you, because uh, I've been told that um, other areas, their Goodwills are just terrible. You almost find nothing there. Yep, yeah. pretty much here. Yeah, same here. So, oh, and on one of those debug kits actually was like a, a developer's build of Fable that I haven't dumped yet. <laughs> wow. But um, I found a, a couple of like store display items uh, and I put them at the auction. Like um, one was a WarriorWare touched or something for, you know, double sided sign. And I put it there for like, I don't know, 20 bucks and it ended up going for 80. And so it, it's a, a fun environment. Um, it's an exhausting environment when you're working it. Uh, but it's, if you get a chance to come out to one of these larger conventions, you know, I highly recommend it. Um, I think, uh, one of the coolest things that happened and it's directly, you know, as a result of my love for Saturn, uh, the guys up at D pad retro gaming, um, in Seattle, uh, friends of mine for many years, uh, they, um, got together uh something i guess they got dropped into their store and they decided that they wanted me to have it um, along with another saturn fan from the local area uh, so they had two i guess and it was the um black edition of the uh sega saturn uh you know japanese style pad for the playstation 2. oh yeah, okay really wow yeah it's my second one of these pads. Like the first one I had was the Morgan purple one. Purple one, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but I'd never seen you know another one, and I never actually thought I would get 
another one. You know, it's kind of went astronomical in price. So how was uh, the overall experience of a uh, PRGE? Like, what, was there a good vibe? Was the event run well? Well, I mean, I'm partial because I, you know, work there, right? I'm, I volunteer this stuff and my gear and everything, but uh, it was, it, it's always, um, for me, a, a fun, you know, event. It's actually the biggest event that I do, you know, in all year long. So getting a chance to come out to one of these conventions and if you, if you do get to come out to Portland during, you know, PRGE uh, visit and you know come enjoy some games did you ever uh did you ever track down that guy who ran off without getting the data for his symphony of the night yeah yeah i'm meeting up with him um this coming week oh okay yeah guys so uh let's get into our topic so we basically made a list of all our experiences with some horror games that have come out in the saturn and we're just gonna go through them and tell you our thoughts See if it's good, bad, if we haven't played it. And uh, give some recommendations for horror games. So if you're in the mood for Halloween, you know, hop in one of these bad boys and just have a blast. First on the list is a pick that Kay tossed in, and that was Capcom Generation 2 Chronicles of Arthur. Hit it, Kay. Hit it. Um, well, it's, you know, Ghosts and Goblins, Ghouls and Ghosts, uh, Super Ghouls and Ghosts as a collective. Um, I think that uh, all the Capcom Generations titles were, you know, really decent values for what they put out. And um, for it being on theme, you know, it's you start out in a graveyard, you know, and you're fighting ghosts and goblins, and it's you it's save your cost. girlfriend, you gotta save your girlfriend, and exactly you know, potentially the world. But um, you know, to be to be honest, I mean, this is not a unique uh, to Saturn title, right? I mean, you could have played it on the arcades or on the NES. I have a version on Genesis. So the appeal to this is that it's within theme. Um, it's uh, I've from what I've played of it, it feels you know uh, fairly solid you know, uh, gameplay wise. I don't feel like I'm missing anything by you know playing this over the arcade version or you know like the NES version. <laughs> and you're getting three games in this, right? Yeah. yeah, you're getting uh, the first Ghosts and Goblins, Ghosts and Ghouls, the Ghouls, ghouls and, and Ghosts. ghosts. Yeah, and Dai Super Makamura, ghouls and, ghost. and then Super Ghouls and Ghosts. Which is, so that's you know you're getting three arcade games. Yeah, that's pretty and nice. The, the Ghouls value, and Ghosts is awesome. The value on these, like, like eBay wise, I and mean, I've seen fluctuate in recent years. Um, the, this used to be a fairly easy to get title under fifty bucks, but you know it's starting to escalate. Uh, I haven't checked recently, but this is one that I don't own an original of yet. How's the uh, how's the quality of the ports on that? I felt that they were okay, you know. But I'm I'm also not like I threw this up there because it was you know within theme and definitely I, I've wanted it like to, I want to be good at this game. I suck at it. Hey, so. nope. I'm in that same boat, dude. I can barely get past the first level in, in Super Ghosts and Ghouls. It's punishingly hard. It really yeah. is. But it is such cl it's classic arcade gameplay. This exactly. would be a great game for a Halloween party where you know, you just want something casual where people can sit down and die and then pass the controller. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so I th I think this is a great pick. Probably um, make a, a good drinking game too at some oh, point. Oh, for sure. Oh. If you, you don't kill your you people. don't drink though. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but, you know, uh, for for those having a Halloween party, you know, with oh, for sure, you know, make sure you you play sober, or you're gonna die a lot. We'll take cider shots. <laughs> yeah. Um, if I were to give this uh like a, a rating, um, I would say this is a, a easy a seven or eight out of ten. You know, it, it's not a unique title, and I think that kind of brings it down a little bit. But even though it's not a unique title to the Saturn, um it was an excellent package you know deal and it can still be had not probably for much longer but can still be had um on occasion for under 50 dollars. i and completely not, yeah. agree no you're good hey um so while we're at it we should probably give it these games a scare score oh a scare how, score you know, yeah how scary are these games and well you have to so, define scare for ghouls and ghosts or ghosts and goblins whatever the hell it's called because yeah. like I mean, I get scared playing that game because like, oh shit, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> like, like seriously, I'm on, I'm on edge when I get that armor off. It's like, all right, 
Well, I'm almost on this level. If I get hit again, I get thrown all the way back. Th that's so. a decent scare, even if it's not within theme. There you go. So right. what? where do you think? Like a five? I'm five thinking out of six. Six out six of ten. Scare. So we've got a, a solid, what did you say, seven overall? Yeah, I mean, it's hard for me to to call this one scary, um, because like within theme scary, sure. one that would frighten you outside of like, oh my god, I'm going to die because I suck at this game or what have you. Um, mm -hmm. This game has been in the arcades since you know time forgotten, and I don't find the visuals to be frightening. It's just the whole like, okay, I'm I'm. It's I'm tense. going to die because it's it's hard. It's a well, even, game. even back then it wouldn't have been scary. I mean, it's it's meant no. to be a cartoon game. So, but it but it but the gameplay is frenetic and it's tense. So I can yeah. see what you mean. Um, and you know the the scare score isn't going to really. It's obviously going to be a joke for some of these titles. It's not sure. gonna be serious. But um, but no. So solid game. Solid uh, game. Chronicles of Arthur. Grab it if you can. <laughs> Burn it if you can't. And there's and there's plenty of other options to play it if you can't afford it either. So it's for sure, not I mean Saturn name. <laughs> yeah, it also this this series came out on the PlayStation as well, and the, like that's why it lost points with me. Is I just don't know if it was any good on the PlayStation. I, yeah, I mean we can't speak to it, right? I don't, I'm sure I there was a PS2 it. collection too, or something like that. Yeah, we're, there was we're not collection. we're not the best about PlayStation because we're kind of biased. Kind of a Saturn. Shit bias. up. Yeah. <laughs> so, Patrick, uh, I hear you're a House of the Dead fan. Can you tell us about it? Okay. So, House of the Dead, uh, for you guys didn't know, it's a uh, basically a rail shooter from, what was it, 96 it was released, right? Oh, it was 98, I think. But essentially, it's a first per a uh, rail shooter. I mean, everyone probably knows it's played in the arcades. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is it actually had a home port. A lot of people know about the second one having a port, but House of the Dead 1 was actually ported to the Saturn. And while it was pretty cheap in Japan, I think it was about 10 15 bucks. it's uh, about a $200 game in the U.S. So, and yeah. that's a hard pill to swallow. It is. It is. And, uh, For a light gun game, no less. Exactly. Yeah. And the final and the verdict, is it actually worth picking up for $200? My answer? Absolutely not. No. Definitely not. The game the is a mess on the Saturn. It, I, it's a, sh it's kind of a shit show for sure. I mean, to be honest, I have to respect them to try to port that. Like, I think the uh, the Sega hardware at the time ported that to the Saturn, because that was like miles ahead of whatever the Saturn could do. Mm -hmm. And it was borderline Naomi. Actually, it was the thing before Naomi. So it was, it was like, STV, wasn't it? Yeah, STV, very, very powerful, well, powerful for the time. It was very, very remarkable that I was able to get to run it all on the Saturn. I mean, the frame rate for the Saturn was like maybe 20 at best. Uh, the graphics looked like ass. I mean, it just looked okay. awful. I'm not, but okay, but it was a, it was a, it was a poor port. Um, but I have to say, I actually think that it's ridiculous that it wasn't better on the Saturn because it, it actually turns out that the Saturn or the Sega Titan video, the STV, was very mm -hmm. similar hardware to the Saturn. The only difference was it had a lot more RAM and it used a cartridge interface instead of a CD yep. block. So so the thing is, it's it's almost blasphemy that it didn't run better because you look at games like Radiant Silver Gun, we're like straight ported over. You know, you look at games, one of your favorite games, um, Die Hard Arcade was an STV game that came over beautifully. Um, yeah. So why why House of the Dead was not better because it wasn't ported by Sega. by Sega. It wasn't really? ported by Sega. It yep. was Tan. Okay, where's my list? Tantalus. Tantalus. Which yep. and they just did a lazy job. Sega published it, but it was Tantalus that ported it. Now, I've heard some rumors that one that the Japanese version is better than the U.S. version, or is it that the U.S. version has red blood? Can you guys uh, answer it's that? It's definitely not better. It, does one port have something different than the other one? Um, it might have been the red blood thing. I know that there was a code that you could do to make the blood red, similar to like the old Mortal Kombat stuff. Okay. Um, I think in the maybe the Japanese version, because the Japanese version 
or may it might have been both. I remember Green Blood the very first there, time. There, there are like these proliferating myths that some Japanese games, some Japanese ports ran better than U.S. ports. Like if they came out a few months later, and the and the development team had a couple more months to work. Like like, um, and those have been um, proved wrong by DF Retro. Um, like the like the Japanese version of Tomb Raider. You know, everybody was saying oh that it has better FPS, but it turns out it's like exactly the same. And I think this is one of those that I heard was supposed to be better, the Japanese version. I, I don't know. I can tell you how it's better. Um, if if you want to play this game, and it's, it's so much cheaper, right? It's so much cheaper, and everything is still in English. There so you go. Yeah, it's you, only about you really like less than 20 bucks. That's yeah. a no brainer. I mean, if you're if you're collecting this game as a US collector, then that that's that's all it's because you are it on the shelf you know right. um but not because you actually want to buy an, a good game yeah uh, and i okay so i'm actually a fan of this game um and as horrible as it looks you know it doesn't look anything like the arcade um i i liked its gameplay you know this is my first experience of house of the dead i didn't play the arcade game till much later but um that for its actual gameplay and its actual horror element if we're saying in theme I think mm -hmm. that this is it wins really highly on in theme. I mean, this is like an easy nine. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's definitely one of the best, one of my favorite shooters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's no Virtual Cop two, uh, you know, graphic wise, but yeah. it's definitely got that intangible charm that some of these old Saturn games have, and uh, and it does. It's got the gore that you that you'd be looking for in, in a Halloween so game. So right before we move on to the next one, like just you know, putting out the number there, um, we all understand that this is a poor port. You know, for its pure fun factor, its overall rating, what would you give this? For fun, uh, I would give it an eight. I agree because I think yeah. it's it's still a really fun game, and sadly, it's really the only way you can play House of the Dead on a home arcade system with a or a home system with a light gun. Yeah, Even if you had Mame, I, I don't think there's any reasonable way you can actually emulate that, to my knowledge. Yeah, I know that there's some um, light gun uh, options out there now, but you know, for purely the home factoring, I, I have to agree with both of you guys. This is a solid eight title, in spite of, you know, it's uh, short fallings. Yeah, it's short fallings. Yeah, I mean, it's ugly, but it's still actually decent gameplay. I thought so. Yeah, frame rate I'd... can screw you up at times, but all, all, all in all, it's still a really fun game. And I mean, if you, if you looking at it at that from that kind of like B horror movie perspective, where it is really campy, you know, um, and that in terms of that, you know, it it's a it's a ten in my book, you know, because it it's definitely it definitely is kind of cheesy at times, mm -hmm. and you know, for that it like wins it wins out, you know, for me, so. It, it, it definitely is a charming Saturn game um, and one that I enjoy. Awesome. So the next uh, three titles I have actually very limited experience with. I'd love to hear you guys' opinions on Lunacy. Lunacy. Okay, so let me get down to it. Uh, Gekka Mugenton Toriko, or Toriko as it was released in the PAL territories. Um, this is a game by System Seicom. And they were involved in a few other games on the Saturn one other that we're going to talk about later, uh, published by Sega. And it's an interactive movie with a simple interface um, of complex puzzles. It's basically interconnected FMV sequences. So night the, trap? First, the first thing you might night be thinking trap. is night trap creature shock. I don't know. Creature shock that I'm not going to go there, but um. <laughs> you know, like you might be thinking sewer shark. You could, I mean, there are any number of um, interconnected FMV games that you might go to in your head and think, oh, well, this is going to be a crap title. Um, and that is what I thought before I really gave this game my time of day. Um, what I can tell you is you are it's it's this game has so much mood. It, the The opening music, just the music. Uh, piece at the beginning is so haunting there's like this red rose and there's like this piano score and it's just 
haunts you to the core. I mean, it makes you think like, what the hell is going to happen in this game? And then you're this traveler named Fred and you have amnesia, of course, because it's a Japanese game and they all have amnesia and you don't know where you are or what you are. And you just kind of have to find your way in the um, with all these strangers and you have to find clues and gather items. And yeah, there are some fetch quests. Um, in fact, there's a lot of fetch quests, but in the meantime, you're they're using those fetch quests as a means of getting you uh, familiarized with the layout of this town, which you're going to need to know in order to solve certain puzzles. Um, the music just is um, one of those things I think that is one of the best parts about the game, and it does uh, use the Saturn sound chip, so and it does it to a, a great effect. And then... Um, there's also two parts of the game. I really don't want to spoil it for anybody who might be interested in, in giving it a shot, but um, this game is split up into two discs and each disc has like a different world or like a different, you know, um, just a different part of, of the, uh, where the game is playing out. And so I can tell you when you get to that second part, um, it just gets kind of weird and there's definitely some horrific things that happen. Um, I don't know how much I should say, you know, I, without just giving it all away and I don't want to spoil the game. All I can say is, um, it's definitely one of those ones that's getting up there, um, because of its rarity. And I think the fact that, you know, I actually made a huge mistake. I copied this from Wikipedia and it says publisher Sega, but that is not true. It was published by Atlas in the U S and I think that. Yeah, I think that's a huge reason why it has. Mm. Um, there's some cachet, you know, with it being an Atlas title, um, for sure. For some people, some people just they have to have all the Atlas titles. So um, that's one of those things. So, but neither of you guys have any experience with this game. I never knew it existed until now. This is this is a learning experience, though. Anyway, it's it, it's it's one of those games that um, you could play in a day um it's probably i mean if you're really quick and you are good at solving puzzles you could probably get through it in like four or five hours um if you take your time you could probably spend eight or nine hours with this game and i think it's i think it's well worth it even if you're just um even if you're just playing an iso of it thematic uh review uh, out of ten thematically i would probably give it about a, a six i mean it's how much it it really it's very ethereal there's a lot of spirits there's a lot of i mean there are some actually really effed up stuff that happens in the second disc um and some deaths and stuff like so yeah i get there are some scary parts where you're just like what the heck and um kind of uh, so i i don't know maybe like a six or seven but but it's not straight up horror it's, it's just much more like psychological you know sure and overall Overall, I'm going to give this uh, an 80%. I think it's a, I think that it has some shortcomings. I definitely think that it um, it struggles to break free of the stigma of the genre. Um, but I think that it um, there's a couple of these games on the Saturn, that, and and this isn't the only one that we're going to talk about. It really does a good job in spite of being an FMV game. So yeah, I think 80% is fair. Nice. So next on our list is D. I know you guys got a lot to talk about this one. Yeah, D is a very interesting game, and the fact that uh, there's no way to pause and there's no save functionality in it, so you gotta play it in one straight run every single time. If yeah. you think about it, you gotta speed run the game each and every time to, to beat it. You got like what about two hours in total, right, from start to finish? Uh, that is correct. Two hours to play, no saves. I don't even. Can you pause it? I don't even think you can pause it. Uh, no. I think all you can do is go to a watch. From what I remembered. Yeah. But it's a really interesting high concept game, which I really respect a lot. And there's not a lot of games like this. And it's high concept because it's Kenji Ino, right? Yeah. I mean, that was his mo is high concept. Exactly, and it's a really unique game compared to no matter what else, what's on the Saturn. I, I really enjoy it. Basically, you're this girl that wanders into this hospital, and you end up wandering into this weird house, and you meet your dead father or something, saying you have to get out for like two hours or something. Yeah. 
you have to find out, uh, you know, why he executed all these people in this hospital. And uh, you are the digital actress, Laura. Um, so Kenji Eno, as another one of his concepts is that he would have a character star in every single one of his games. And her name was Laura. And I believe in, this, in D, her name was Laura Harris. And then in Enemy Zero, it was Laura Lewis. And then in D2, it was Laura Parton. But it was always the digital actress, Laura. And so you control the game through FMV sequences. And yeah, you just, you're just going around and exploring this, this, I don't know. It's like you get teleported or something to like a haunted mansion, correct? Yeah, it's really interesting. There's a lot of interesting twists and turns and it's a lot of, uh, yeah, it's, it's like a mansion you have to reverse and you have to solve these puzzles and try to get out within the limit. But yeah, I um, think but, it's a really great game. Yeah. So, um, you know, bunch of people dead haunted mansion really really weird mind bending things that you see you've got 2 hours to complete this game with no saves and no pause um what what do we give this game as far as scare factor i, I mean i think some this... jump scares so i'm getting some jump scares and it, it had an overall creepiness to it like the resident evil games usually tend to do i mean if this is the kind of game you're going to play on halloween night with the lights off you know I think that it is a it's a worthy title for for a Halloween playthrough. But it probably a seven. That's fair. And overall, K. This is another one of those titles that I've not actually gotten to play. Um, and... I'm a fan of it in theory. Yeah, I know. I, so you, I got you have a great respect for it, but uh, it's and it's in your collection, but you just haven't had a chance. Yeah, it, it's really. Um, there are a lot of games that are exactly like that. Um, not even just for the Saturn. I, I'm, I haven't even played Final Fantasy VII all the way through yet. You know, like just nobody has. Yeah. Well, we're um, gonna. Oh, go ahead. I I wanted to um, say something. I was it D that had the limited edition that um, was delivered. Uh, no, that was Enemy Zero. It was Enemy that was Zero. The okay, That's the one you want, right? But yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a pipe dream. No, I, no, right. you'll get it. You'll get it. <laughs> but yeah, no, but, I mean, th this this to me sounds uh, exactly up my alley for Halloween play. Um, you know, and we've talked about this, you know, even in our notes. Uh, the fact that it is such a short game, and you can't stop playing literally. Um, you know, th this would be perfect for a, a Halloween theme party. I feel. I, th I think you need to play it with another person like two heads are better than one yeah. you know you'd be able to drive each other through it and and help but uh because i can see how you might not get around yourself but I, this would be a fun game to sit down with one or two people and you know hash it out i might honestly have to try that and we try to have a uh, a halloween game night here with myself and a couple of the locals and uh PT was going to be our our game this year, but we might we might have to pull out the Saturn for this. It is a it is notable title though because um it was originally released on the 3DO, mm -hmm. which was a which was the console that Kenji Eno was um, pulling for in the beginning, um but he had um he had deep ties with Sony, and so um when it came around to be ported for the PlayStation and the Saturn, um. It was going to be ported on both consoles, but Kenji Eno was not happy at all um, with how Sony handled the distribution, the publishing and distribution of the PlayStation copy of the game. Um, and it was something that, you know, him being, uh, I don't know, persnickety or I don't know, just being a personality, you know, uh, like you said, he's high concept and he has these ideas of, you know, what he wants. And if you don't give him what he wants, Sega was much more accommodating um, and Sony, you know, kind of whatever they did, they pissed him off so much to the tune that he refused to release his follow up game on their platform. So the next game we're going to talk about is Warp or Kenji Ino's second tour de force enemy zero, which would be a Sega Saturn exclusive. Very expensive one at that. And well, true and i mean i guess that's true even back in the day i mean it was a four disc game 
and it was in low supply. I, I know that um, the electronic boutique that I got it at, even back in the day, it was like a sixty dollar game, you know, so or sixty or seventy. But so it wasn't it wasn't like a budget title at all. Um, do, do either of you guys want to open up and talk about this? I don't have much experience playing actually Enemy Zero more than D, mostly because of that price factor. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, this, this game, it, it it stars that digital actress, Laura, again, uh, this time Laura Lewis. And this is this game, I, I feel, improves upon everything that D did right. Um, it improves upon the the way that the FMV interconnect, you know, works and the way that the navigation works. Um, the concept is, is uh, again, Kenji, you know, it's you are um you are one of the crew members on a spaceship that's traveling uh called the aki and the opening sequence uh starts out with uh, michael nyman on the piano um really interesting story i guess kenji you know kind of um stalked michael nyman and tracked him down and like literally like <laughs> locked him in his hotel room and and you know basically begged him repeatedly to do this and he didn't even want to do it, but he was just like, okay, fine, I'll just do it if you stop bugging me, you know? So that's, that's that was the personality that Kenji, you know, you know, he just, um, he just had to have things his way, but, you know, it worked. I'm so glad that he did because that opening sequence just sets the tone and it's so haunting and you wake up from hypersleep and you find that, um, you know, your crew members are being murdered and you have got, uh, your cargo is lethal and it's also invisible. And you're going to need the aid of like a pinging earpiece that just kind of pings in your ear and gives you kind of uh, audio cues of where this enemy is. Um, and you're using a weapon that only gives one shot. Is, is that right? Oh, you guys, don't, you guys can't speak to this one. Well, I'm just going to go quick. Basically, you have a weapon that you have to like find recharging stations for. And when you do use it, you only get like one or two shots. You got to wow. time. You got to time the shots. Um, you got to time the shots perfectly, and you got to use these audio pinging cues to find, you know, where this thing is. And it starts to ping louder, and it pings quicker. Ping, 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 ping. Before you know it, it's just right up on you, and you're dead. And so um, the corridor shots where you're actually um, being hunted are all in 3D, and it's actually a really it's a really nice looking 3d engine uh considering it's you know on the saturn so well, I a, is it a one hit hit kill thing so if you it miss, is a one hit kill fucked. if you miss you might it all depends because if you miss it usually it's not as close as you thought it was and you might have another chance at getting it just barely but the thing is this gun that you're using has to charge not only does not only does the gun have to charge on a station to basically charge up power so it can be used but the gun also has to be charged when you're pulling the trigger you have to hold down the trigger charge up the gun and then release the the charge and it and and then hit your enemy and so their disc zero of the game is actually just a training stage that looks a lot like that metal gear solid vr missions you know mm -hmm. it's just like this virtual training for this thing and um and I think, I think Metal Gear Solid did the same thing for the same reason, is at that time, we hadn't really played anything like that. So we had to be like trained on how to play this because it was just so bizarre. It was so different than anything that we'd done before. So, um, But it builds up a lot of tension. It's definitely, there are some psychological twists in this game. It wouldn't be a, a Kenji Ino game without some bizarre, weird psychological stuff going on thematic and, uh, score thematic score um it, it is it is like a ripoff of a ridley scott film um so if you consider alien or any of that kind of you know outer space horror genre to fit in with halloween then yeah sure i i would give it probably like a 70 60 or 70 on the you know fitting in with the halloween but it's out of, definitely out of a, 10 holy shit <laughs> out of 10 yeah you know because it's not an overtly halloween game but i I'm feel sure, like it, but... it it deserves to be on this list because it's a horrific game you know right 
What about and, the uh, D? I, don't, I know we I don't think we hit the rate the D at all. Well, I feel like thematically D is more Halloween, just because it's like the haunted mansion and yeah, and um, death traps and stuff like that. You know, it just it just it's more cliche, I guess you could say. Um, this game is not as cliche, but I mean, it is definitely a ripoff of you know Ridley Scott films, but. Yeah, that's a good thing in this case. So nice. overall score? Uh, overall score, probably like an 85. Nice. Or 90. You know, I mean, it is an FMV game, and that is going to be difficult for some people to go back to at this point. Some people are just not going to want to deal with those segments. Right. Um, but I feel like they're well done enough that... Um, you know, more more of these games, these games that, that tend to try your patience or um, they tend to have certain constructs that that are haven't aged well. I find that they're better uh, in, a, in a group, you know, because yeah. then you can kind of mystery science theater it, you know, or you can kind of like talk about it and, and, and uh, exactly. you know, make light of, you know, you can, you know, talk about, oh, wow, how far things have come, you know, um, or how you, you know, you're kind of maybe you remember the game a little better than it really is you know but uh I, I don't know it's one it's one game that i have a fond place in my heart for so i feel like i'm a little bit uh and i feel like i'm biased you know we're kind of coming a little bit full circle on this because um and not directly related to this but full motion video games uh, and maybe it was just uh nostalgia for night trap itself but limited run games did uh night trap and i try to get on that and it just was phenomenal how many people were upset that they weren't able to get a copy. So, you know, maybe jump in on this bandwagon uh, and relive this on the Saturn uh, with Enemy Zero and D. Um, I wanted to throw something in about uh, Kenji Ino. Um, I read this article in Wikipedia many years ago and actually had forgotten it until I refreshed uh, for the notes on this. Um Eno uh, kept a lot of the violent sequences to uh, the game D uh, to himself and postponed delivering the master copy for publication um, so that he could get onto a plane and hand deliver it. He would be forced to hand deliver the masters. And apparently while on the plane, he swapped a clean version for a uncensored version of the game. Um, after it had already gone through uh, approval processes. So you can't get much more hardcore than that. Having a director you know, uh, for a video game be willing to go through such immense uh, leaps and bounds to make this happen you know, and, and get his true vision out there. Well, he had a complete disregard for authority. You know, I mean, he his his attitude was literally like a fuck you to the man you know and and the funny thing was that he was kind of a fortunate son uh within sony and it was one of the he was like an so like he did some things that if you weren't kenji eno and you didn't have the kind of relationship that he had with ken kutaragi um he probably they probably would have sent the yakuza after him <laughs> <laughs> but honestly like he could just do he could do whatever he wanted to and nobody would you know they said no you can't touch him yeah. You know, so so it, it was a he was a he was an interesting, an interesting individual. On that note, um, Pat, Resident Evil. What about it? I'm just joking. <laughs> All right, so um, I think it's a Evil, video game. Yes. So uh, one of the uh, one of the most interesting games on the Saturn that in regards to horror is Resident Evil. Uh, for everyone that. That knows that originally came out on the PlayStation about a year before it came out on the Saturn, and it and that's basically what, it's sort of the hallmark, the killer app of the PlayStation is always thought of as, well, at least one of them being Resident Evil. It later got a port on a Saturn, and in my opinion, I think it looks a little bit better. For those that don't know about Resident Evil, it's a survival horror game where you uh, get chased by a bunch of wild dogs and animals, and you're locked in this mansion. And it's and things don't see don't see uh things don't uh, appear as they seem, and I don't know and I'm gonna avoid spoilers but there's there's a bunch of different twists and turns throughout the game, which would definitely make make you come back for more and be like wow I never had any idea 
that I'd see that coming. And uh, actually, one of the one of the biggest things that you notice that the voice acting is complete garbage. <laughs> yes. From the get go, but I have to say though, I think that's where the charm lies. A lot of people like the the slag on it, but I actually think the voice acting really makes the game feel like an authentic B movie. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, when, when it came to the Saturn, it actually got a slightly graphical improvement because compared to the PlayStation, it was using the what exactly it was the the it wasn't it wasn't the the polygon shading or something else. I think it's a quad shading it used on there. It made it look made it look a little bit more smoother, and it got a little bit a little bit more different things on the PlayStation. Like they had a, a couple different modes, and it had a, another enemy in the game. And I guess I think it cost you two extra as well. Yeah, it had a had an exclusive like a reskinned hunter called a tick, and it had a second alternate tyrant prior to the game's final battle. Yeah, so you get the so if you're badass, you can fight two part tyrants, two tyrants at once. Oh, I was um when I was talking about House of the Dead before the Japanese version being more free. I was actually thinking about Resident e- Resident Evil. The Japanese version is considered the most gore laden of all platforms. Yeah, it uh actually the U.S. actually got shafted even on the director's cut on the PlayStation, but that's the PlayStation. But essentially, what happened was. They wanted to re- release the Japanese version, all the bloody scenes and the FMVs, all the fucked up deaths, but unfortunately, uh, one of the masters got switched up and they reversed it, but later put it on the PlayStation Store, or the PlayStation website for you to view. But, officially in the US, there's no uncensored version of it, even the, the U- the, uh, the director's cut on any of them, the DualShock, all censored in the u.s unfortunately hmm. and actually uh, another fun fact about the playstation one at least is that they have a different th- opening theme when it's doing the character introductions it's like this japanese band that plays for the credits and the credits and the opening but they changed it in america because the the developer of it uh, shinji akami didn't like didn't like the music at all so they went with a different one that he sort of was the vision but they had to use that old theme because the old one that they originally had for the Japanese one, because they uh, had the, like uh, Capcom had this house band. It was like sort of oh, have these guys play in your game because we have the rights and have the band to afford it. So they wouldn't play it on that, but they switched it out later on and it in both the English and Japanese title. The thing I remember most about this game was the um, the Japanese version having a bit of controversy because of one of the uh, characters, uh, models, uh, people uh, associated as, uh, or people thought that it looked like uh, basketball star Michael Jordan, like one of the very first uh, killings that happened. I see. Really? I've never heard that. R.I.P. Oh, Jordan. Have- and was that the killings for uh, the first guy that ki- killed by the dogs or the zombie that ate zombie that guy? That I think the zombie that was eating that guy, yeah, they had, like, apparently they... When you saw the, the uncensored version, like the Japanese version, they said that the head that was rendered looked a lot like Michael Jordan. Interesting. Yeah, but, uh, but yeah, the... Uh, unfortunately, I think the... Uh, in terms of the themes and all the other cut content... I think the Japanese, the the Saturn Japanese one doesn't have any of that stuff. It's basically just a port of the U.S. version, except with the Japanese text. I'm not sure if I think it's censored in the both Japanese and U.S. for the Saturn as well. Well, that scene is in it. That's actually why I picked up Biohazard. Oh, for this, okay. Yeah, it's the in Saturn. the Sa- actually Saturn one, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I I guess uh, but the Japanese one still has the the the. Uh, English theme opening and closing theme though, right? That I can't remember. Yeah, I don't know. Since I pulled that one out. Well, I was gonna say, um, considering you're a pretty big Resident Evil fan, do you think that this game is worth the the price that it's currently commanding in the U.S. for the U.S. copy? Well, I mean, the last time I checked, it really wasn't awful. I mean, it was like seventy to eighty bucks, which is about right for a medium tier tier Saturn game. I think it's worth it. Um. 
It really depends what you mean by worth it. So do you mean like worth like you haven't played Resident Evil One? You want the you want a good experience, or do you mean no, like just, it's is worth, it worth it to you? Because I know you are almost exclusively you you go exclusively Japanese games. Um, but I've heard some people say that you know navigating the menu, some of the, some getting around in the in the Japanese game can be, you know. A little bit tedious, but uh, it, it's playable. I mean, and if you know Resident Evil and you've played it already, then you know you could probably just get the Japanese version. Yeah, uh, that's that's what I was about to say. Basically, it just depends on how you want to play it. If you haven't played Resident Evil One before and you have no idea what to do, I would recommend probably playing the PlayStation One version in case you don't like it. Because uh, while a lot of people always love the remake, uh, the first one sometimes could be a hit or miss i like it personally i think the cheese factor makes it really good and i think just the the gore aspect of it is a lot i don't know i think it's a lot more fun in, in the playstation one version especially the decapitations are just so stupid oh yeah but uh yeah i i personally think that i think it's worth it um if you love biohazard resident evil biohazard and you played it all the time and you just want to play it for the saturn the Japanese version could suffice. I personally, I like the U.S. version because it's just... I think someone was talking about how the Japanese... The U.S. cover was like the best looking out of all of them. Where hmm. it basically has the zombie on the cover of it. And I, and I like it a lot, the long box form. And I love having that sort of... Ma that material on it. It's actually one of the only Saturn games I have that's actually an actual copy of the U.S. version. That Funny okay. enough, that and D are the... Or the two only two U.S. version games I have. Oh wow! That are physical. That, that speaks a lot. Yeah. So does. thematically, I have to say that this one pretty much knocks it out of the park. And yes. So th this for ten. me gets a ten. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I do agree. I I think all of Resident Evil, especially the survival horrors, survival horror versions of it, third person, are probably the scariest games even today. Mm -hmm. Just because it, just it's freaky and the atmosphere is so creepy. Yep. I, I mean, don't know. It's, it's There's just zombies. Some... Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, almost any zombie game. I mean, I don't remember already <laughs> what we thematically put House of the Dead, but if it wasn't the same, I mean, these two are thematically perfect for a Halloween episode. Yeah, thematically, I give them a ten. They're really fun, really fun games. Uh, really great Halloween games, and I'm actually going to play two. I played one last year, so. Nice. So, what do you give it as an overall, and uh, specifically the Saturn version? The Saturn version. So, in terms of just a Resident Evil game, I would give it a eight. As a Saturn Resident Evil game, I'd probably give it around the same eight or nine. Uh, it's all. It's re a really great game. It's a lot of fun, but there's still some things that are kind of irky. I mean, if mm. you're not used to the tank controls, you're gonna have a bad time. Because it, it gets uh, frustrating when you're trying to run away from an enemy and you run straight into their arms and you die. Mm -hmm. I think they're easier on the Saturn D-pad, though, than the PlayStation D-pad. Yeah, I think that's that's more of the Saturn having the better D-pad over the PlayStation 1. Sure, but I mean that plays into your decision of which version to play. Yeah, but if, if you really just want to play it for the first time and you haven't touched Resident Evil, I'd probably go with the PlayStation versions because there's a ton of port different versions of it. And it's incredibly cheap. Sure. Good point. So that brings us to Deep Fear. Yeah. Which, which is, would be Sega's answer to Resident Evil. The biggest knockoff that never came out of the US in the US, unfortunately. So the interesting factor about um Deep Fear was that there is a US port, it just wasn't published. Exactly. Uh, really? It, it mm -hmm. was released on Lost and Found, uh, I think it was volume three. Which is uh, basically a, a bootleg uh, series. Uh, they only produced uh, three titles um, of unreleased uh, Saturn titles or um, Saturn tools. Um, and I actually do own Lost and Found Volume Three. I think that might have been uh, what is now called PRGE, you know, the Port and Retro Gaming Expo. I think that was an exclusive for the predecessor to that, which was like the Northwest Classic Gaming Enthusiast Expo or something like that. And that requires the an action replay or the or the uh, the mod chip to play. Um, you would need uh, because it would be a backup or you know reproduction. You would need a way of 
being able to play copies uh, of that disc, uh, you know, for it to launch. Um, but it but, is NTSC 60 hertz. Yes. And, and it's in English. So. Yes. So it does exist. I mean, like you, you have all three region options, right? Like it did come out in Japan. Uh, it did come out in uh, the uh, European and PAL territories. Um, so if you, in fact, that was the, this was the last European game, if I'm not mistaken. It is. It was. Yeah. yeah and it's a so, pretty pricey one. It it was. <laughs> that was one of the more expensive games I've purchased over the years. Um, the uh, the title though, I mean, if you wanted to play it on your US Saturn, you have a means of playing backups. You know, we'll probably find a way of making it available for you guys. A really fun game, yeah. But uh, in terms of the gameplay, I think it's it's a really interesting game. I mean, it, it basically takes the a nod from Resident Evil. You know, the tank controls, the the different uh, voice acting, and it's really creepy. I I only got about a quarter of the way through, but I'm really I really want to sit down and actually beat it because I love I love survival horror games, especially ones that are based off of Resident Evil. Even if it's a rip off, I mean. But yeah, the voice acting is horrible in the, in the game as well, just like Resident Evil 1, so... It was a one-for-one one rip-off. Yeah. Even the bad stuff got ripped off. Yeah, you right. know, I think... Um, but I think it's a worthwhile playthrough. I, I did a playthrough about six months ago, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, so... Um, just to just want to say real quick, I think that Sega did improve upon... Um, the the fact that you are able to fire while running, <laughs> so that's cool. You're able to change weapons on the fly with a with a right bumper and uh, what else? Oh, the oxygen management system is cool. Anyway, some cool features. So as a Resident Evil knockoff, right? That's what we're we're calling it. Um, do you consider it overall better than the Resident Evil on Saturn, or is it on par, or is it you know fall short? I think it plays better than Resident Evil, but I think that it is not Resident Evil, and that's that's really just the thing. Is there there can only be one original, and Resident Evil, what it had going for it is, um, you know, it had the haunted mansion, it had like the zombies. I think that it's just. Um, it's kind of always going to live in the shadow of Resident Evil, be, you know, Capcom at its best, you know, sure. and it was the originator, you know, so people are always going, going to compare it to Resident Evil. But I think that if you play it with an open mind, um, you'll see what improvements were made and you will probably agree that quite a bit of it is more is more playable to a certain degree than the original Resident Evil on Saturn. Yeah, and yeah, it's definitely uh, definitely worth it. It's not like a ripoff in a bad way either. It's a really good game. Thematically, what you guys score? I give it a nine. It's it's. It, I mean, I played it. and It was pretty scary. A pretty. It gave me that same Resident Evil feeling of isolation, or sem at least semi isolation from the world. Yeah. Which I yeah, think I'm... is probably one of the most scariest thing to me is isolation. All right, and then overall, I give it about uh, a nine. Eight or nine, yeah, some uh, eight and a half, eighty-five percent. It's like um, I don't know if, if if you were to give Resident Evil like a what did you did you give Resident Evil an overall nine? I give it. I, give, I think I give it an eight or a nine. Yeah. Yeah, I'd give I'd give Deep Fear like an eighty-five percent or eight point five. Very nice. Now, uh, final question on that uh, before I move on. Is it worth importing uh, the Japanese version since the PAL version is so damned expensive? Um, I can't say if in the matter of gameplay, because I know there's a lot of text like Resident Evil, so I mean, you might not know what's going on, you might miss some beats, but I mean, if you if you just want to listen to people talk and you can handle the Japanese menus, maybe, but especially that oxygen management system, mm. I'm, not, I'm not, I can't give like a 100% go for that compared to the UK one if you want official if you have to own the game if you have to go for the Japanese if you want to enjoy the game I think your best bet is to buy a reproduction of the US NTSC version play it at 60 hertz in English and really experience it and if you get a nice repro of it 
you know, that has good art and everything, you know, then you'll feel like you own, you have something, but I don't know. It's just, it's just way out of everybody's range. Now, if you're going to try to go for the PAL version and then I don't even, that's, I, if that's 50 Hertz. Yeah. Uh, it might well, not work on your television if you're in America exactly. though. So that gives us our, our top three, um, uh, for what we'd recommend, we're going to start with uh, the Vampire series, known as the Darkstalker series here stateside. Uh, I think thematically, you know, it, first off, it's a fighting game that basically puts all of the horror, like traditional trope uh, horror theme monsters together um, to battle it out. I like to describe it as if the Universal Monsters got into a giant fight on who, who's the best Universal Monster. And just fought, fought shows to the death, and then there's this hot cat lady and some and some bat lady in between. The succubus. That's so, what yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, so yes, uh, this uh, was one of my personal picks, um, uh, particularly uh, Vampire Savior. It's just a fantastic game. Uh, it's still pretty uh, easy to um, acquire. Uh, that's a, an import only. Uh, Vampire Hunter, which is uh, Darkstalkers. Um, excuse me, Night Warriors, Darkstalkers Revenge uh, for Saturn. Uh, also not a hard game to acquire. Both can be had for under 50 bucks. You might even be lucky enough to get them both uh, literally under 50. Um, yeah, they're, they're not expensive at all. No. Uh, it is a fighting game, so you know you're gonna want to have a party group uh, to be able to play this uh, and really enjoy it, because um, otherwise you, you're not gonna get much uh, replay value out of it, you know, unless you really enjoy playing against CPU characters. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a great Capcom fighter. Uh, do you know if uh, do you know if the red, uh, little Red Hood is in is in the second one, the Vampire Hunter? I know she's yes. not in the first one. No, she's in she's in the second one. Oh, cool. all fifteen! It can, it contains all fifteen characters from the original Vampire Savior, I gotcha. uh, plus three Night Warriors who were left out of the original arcade release. Yeah, um, I have the first one for the Saturn, but I don't have the second one. And the first one doesn't require the four meg RAM card, but Vampire Savior, I believe, does. Yes, it's got a lot going on. Like it, it does. I feel like Vampire Savior. Dare I say it's it's up there in my book? It's up there with you know zero three. As um, I mean, it, it it's not that level of god status, but I mean, it's definitely one of my favorite Capcom fighters. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I, I have the um, the Vampire Chronicles for the Dreamcast, which mm -hmm. has the ability to play all three versions of that, and it's probably one of my favorite fighters of all time. And that's saying a lot because you're not a you're an SNK boy. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I I love I love SNK. There there's a lot of Capcom fighters that that give it a run for its money just just i just love the capital ones because they're so unique like jojo like vampire hunter exactly i mean that's one of the best things i like about how unique it is and yeah i, I can't deny that snk has some unique ones i i don't know there's just something about the capcom ones that just keeps bringing me back they're Ooh. just so well oh, yeah. put together Very they are roles and these, um, the vampire, the Darkstalkers games have just so much style. You know, they're just brimming with uh, just artistic style and um, just flair. Like, I mean, you know, the Street Fighter seri series are solid, and you know what you're going to get. But I mean, coming to coming to the Darkstalkers series from the Street Fighter series is just wacky. You know, it's just kind of like off the wall, almost like all these ideas that they had that they couldn't use, <laughs> you know. It just makes um, it a bigger shame that the the, the vampire, the Darkstalkers characters are just relegated to uh, references in different uh, smaller Capcom games and mm -hmm. one or two characters in MVC. Mm-hmm. I had heard uh, some time ago that you know when a lot of the uh, Capcom fighters between like '93 and '97 were in development, they were all uh, supposed to be like uh, testing ideas for what would eventually become Street Fighter Three, and this was uh, supposedly in there. You know, some of the mechanics that were in Dark, the Dark Starker series, and also like X Men: Children of the Atom and all the Versus series. Uh, were just 
uh, ideas that they were playing around with, you know, uh, on their way to actually get uh, to Street Fighter Three. Yeah, I've heard that too. That um, they weren't able to take chances with, you know, a game like Street Fighter Three. They were able to use games like Darkstalkers as a test bed for a lot of those concepts and ideas to try to, you know, because they could get away with that on the basis of, you know, it's kind of their wacky off the wall, you know, B side, you know. Um, exactly. But the cool thing is they did such a good job um, playing up the campy B horror kind of aspect, but doing it right. This is not a battle monsters, you know, this mm-hmm. is, um, this is the real deal. You know, these, um, the animation is just so fluid. The character designs are a uh, second to none. I mean, it's just Capcom. It's exactly what you would expect from a top tier Capcom fighter. It almost makes me wish that they would just release 2D fighters again, like they're doing with, uh, uh, what company is it? The one that uh, that Square is doing with like some some of their lesser known series, like they're making those R- small RPGs like I Am Setsuna, mm-hmm. yeah, things like that. I really wish Capcom would just be like, okay, let's make these small 2D fighters, and like have these and like expand these series because I would love to have a st- another Doc Stalkers, even if it's just a 2D one. You listening, Capcom? And while you're at it, would you please make a proper Mega Man title? Nah, that ain't okay. happening, you know. Yeah, no, that's just forget right. that. Just, just, just stick with Darkstalkers, you know. We don't have right. to do Mega Man. I think that I was looking at the soundtrack, and one of the, one of the titles was like "Fetus of God" or something. There's some crazy titles for the songs on there. Damn, that's metal. I know. There's some. There's some crazy backgrounds. If you if you play this game and load all the different maps or backgrounds or whatever, there's some really weird stuff going on in the background. Yeah there was i i played like uh it was the first dark soccer's game on the playstation um i, I played it almost every day after school uh throughout like i want to say ninth or tenth grade um for like all of the fall and uh yeah it, it definitely it, it's a lot more bizarre you know it, it's cutesy bizarre but there's a lot more bizarre going on in this game than I think just about any other mainstream fighter, you know, until you came up with like, you know, uh, Guilty Gear and Blaze Blue. Exactly. That's what Am I the only one? Am I the only one here though that's upset that they never changed Morrigan Sprite? <laughs> it was like always the same, same Morrigan Sprite. I kind of like it. I mean, they, they do that with a lot of their games like, uh, hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> so, um, Thematically, I mean, you can't really beat that statement. Uh, this is as if uh, all the Universal monsters got together and, and you know had a battle to the death, or undeath, whatever. Uh, so wah, thematically, wah. this is a ten. Yeah, I yep, know. Bad ten. joke. Dad joke. But um, um, yeah, no, this is a ten for sure. Both of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of the overall score. Uh, I find it kind of hard to score them because they're both solid fighting games. I don't know. What do you guys think? I think I, uh, I think Night Warriors is a thoroughly enjoyable game. It's it's a little simpler. Like Vampire Savior does more, and it's a little more complex. But I think that Night Warriors is thoroughly enjoyable. I give it a. I I think it's just as good. I think they're both great. What do you think, yeah. Kay? Uh, I'm a huge fan of most Capcom fighters. This is uh. So much so that I've actually tried to purchase every, you know, Darkstalkers uh, thing I could for a while. Um, do you have CPS2 hardware? I do have CPS2 hardware. I don't mm-hmm. have a Darkstalkers board yet. Uh, I do, have, a, do you have any uh, extra CPS2? Um, right now, CP, well, less Extras? so off topic. <laughs> I'll talk to you off, uh, off yeah, the cast. Yeah, because I'm, but... looking for, I'm looking for some, some, some hardware stuff. But anyways, what are you saying? Well, so... The thing that you know loses the overall for me on these games is that you can purchase them for fairly cheap on uh, Xbox Live uh, and other formats. I mean, they had a couple of collections, I think, on the PSP, um, and it might be available digitally. Um, and I'd like to support the Capcom trying to continue doing that. Uh, these games are cheap. If you're a Saturn collector and you want to play it on Saturn, go get them. Um, overall, I would give these, uh, if we were doing a fighting game show, these would get a solid, you know, nine and a half. Um, for a Halloween theme show, mm-hmm. these are kind of, you know, my overall score is going to get knocked down a little bit. I'm going to give these about an eight. 
fair because, you know, I mean, it's monsters, but it's kind of general. Right. I mean, honestly, you could put this game in and be done with it in like half an hour and, you know, okay, so we've we've gotten together. We've played a Halloween themed game and it was all fighting game. You could have fun with it. Don't don't get me wrong on that. But, you know, I think that if you are if you're going to resign yourself to one or two games um, on our list for your Halloween, you know, uh, event, uh, this probably isn't the game to play for that, you know, uh, particularly if you're playing by yourself. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, I do agree about eight. Eight for me. Uh, I, in terms of fighter, I, in terms of fighters, uh, personally, I, I think I'd put. Uh, I kind of like Night Warrior. I haven't had a lot of experience with the second one for the Saturn, so I can't really give an opinion. From what mm -hmm. I played from the Dreamcast one, it's fantastic. So. Yeah, it's a great fighting game. I mean, just just realize you got that four meg expansion, and they're using like every bit of it because the animation. Just insane. Um, if you've if you played Zero Three, then you know. Um, it, much like Zero Three, this is an arcade conversion that's almost it's almost one for one, you know. And uh, this is just some of those character animations are jaw dropping. So I think it, that's really why gorgeous. it gets the edge. It gets the edge just because of the RAM cart and the fact that it's just the pinnacle. I'm sure that. Um, that Capcom would have liked to do the same thing with Night Warrior, but you know, I, f I feel like Night Warriors, much like Street Fighter Alpha 2, it's very accessible, it's very affordable, um, you know, and it's an, it's a great game, easy to recommend. But I, I give the edge to uh, the Vampire Savior and I give it a nine. All right, so down to the last two uh, Akumo Joe Dracula X, uh, also known Nocturne. as Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Or Nocturne of the Moonlight. Nocturne of the Moonlight. It's really weird. Well, it was Symphony of the Night on the PlayStation. Yeah. Yeah. And Nocturne in the Moonlight? Is that, yeah. what, is that what she said? Okay. Yeah, but uh, of course... Like, so this like is said, kind of a tragedy. Huh? This game is kind of a tragedy. A, a bit. Uh, I, I'm From gonna the have programming. Mixed, yeah, I'm going to have a mixed opinions on it. So, essentially... Uh, Essentially, for those of you who don't know, Sympathy of the Night is uh, really what coined, uh, really coined the term Metroidvania, where essentially you're exploring this giant castle and you get these upgrades and weapons, and you slowly explore, kill enemies, level up your weapons, level up your character, and go through the, the, the castle, and of course you try and kill Dracula, and spoilers, you end up killing Dracula at the end. But what happens between is very interesting. Uh, basically, I, I believe that the premise is like, uh, Victor Velmart disappears, you need to hunt him down, and things in the castle get kind of crazy, trying to hunt him down and kill Dracula. And then the castle turns upside down, right? Yeah, well, it depends. You can, you can oh, actually right. kill alternate. a certain character and end the game early, but if you What's actually you flip it, if you actually don't kill a certain character, you do the, char the, the castle and you actually have the true ending of the game. Right, but yeah, it's it's a it's a really fun game. Uh, but like um like Dave was saying, it has some de some uh, really pitfalls. Uh, I believe it uh, the downscale they had the downscale of resolution because it wasn't as square on the PlayStation, right? Well, it uh, okay. Well, the reason I said it was a tragedy developed by Konami even the port on the Saturn was developed by Konami so like for all intents and purposes it should have been better you know they should have put in the time um, but they decided to cut corners um, and instead of instead of building this game for the Saturn's 2D hardware which we know the Saturn can move sprites like no other console that I know of um, they decided to literally port over the PlayStation's uh, build and and how the PlayStation handled 2D graphics was basically flat polygons with um, with texture map 2D texture map. So sprites were basically a 2D texture map placed on top of mapped on top of a flat polygon, and so there were problems with that when it comes to the way that the Saturn handles 3D and the way that the Saturn handles hardware transparencies with 3D and just the, how the graphics are rendered. So yes, to speak to the stretching that you're talking about, 
Um, basically, PlayStation runs at 256 by 224 resolution, and the Saturn does 352 by 240. So it kind of stretches the it stretches the pixels. So like every third pixel is janky, um, which just makes the game off-putting visually. Okay, and so then, at reverse, they actually had to upscale it. Yeah, and then there were longer loading times. The transparencies were altered because, as I said before, the Saturn wasn't great with alpha transparencies when dealing with poly- polygonal graphics. It was it could do it just fine. If, if this had been built as a 2D sprite game, uh, the Saturn would have been able to handle this game and would have probably done it even better, if you can even imagine. I mean, because the PlayStation game is a masterpiece. Um, considering what they were working with with the PlayStation hardware, it's a masterpiece and it plays beautifully. But I think that the Saturn version could have been the epitome or, you know, the just the, the very best version of the game. Instead, um, as a consolation prize, they give you an extra playable character, which is Maria. And they give you some new items and enemies and two new areas, the Cursed Prison and the Underground Garden. And the cool uh, thing and about it a- as well is that uh, you actually get to play all the characters from the beginning. So if you want to start a new game with uh, with Richter or Maria, I mean, you, you could if you wanted to. I mean, so it's still a really enjoyable game. and I mean, a lot of people still say, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's still Symphony of the Night. Um, and if you can swallow... It's, it, you know, it's kind of, it's just kind of sad, you know, knowing that Konami developed this, um, they could have done a better job. Yeah. Um, do you, my perspective as somebody that actually beat it for the first time on Saturn, I have to say that I, that I never really noticed any issues with the game that prevented me from enjoying it as well, besides the non-English. Uh, one of the things that really bothered me is that it lagged quite a bit, especially with a lot of enemies. And it would be get so bad to the point where it's like a slideshow trying to do anything. Yes. Mm-hmm. But, when there was a lot of stuff going on on the screen. Yeah, I don't um, know if the PlayStation suffered from that at all, or no, no, not at all. PlayStation was perfectly smooth because this it was built for that geometry transfer engine. See, the the Saturn just couldn't handle that because the Saturn had to do the same thing. It had to. Okay, so. When the Saturn handles 3D, it takes a sprite sheet and it splits it up into, or it takes a texture and splits it up into several different sprites and considers that a sprite sheet. And then it maps it to, you know, a basketball or an apple. So each vertice is an individual sprite being rendered. And the Sat- and VDP2 is incredibly good at that. With this, it had to do things the exact same way as the PlayStation. It had to take one flash shaded poly. Um, which it already didn't work well with polys. It worked with quads. It could do polys, but just not very well. And then it had to map a, a, um, a really intricately... Um, in other words, it had to map a, a texture that took up a lot of, you know, several kilobytes of RAM, you know? Um, and it had to deal with several of those on the screen at the same time. And because of the way that the um, VDP2 just could not shine in that in that circumstance, I don't really want to get too far into it, technically but it just you know the saturn just was not capable of rendering the same way that the playstation was on that level the saturn had to do it a different way and they weren't willing to retool and start from the scratch and you know really develop the game for the console because development constraints and budgets you know it just wasn't there and at that time the saturn was already waning in popularity even in japan so um, because the playstation was becoming dominant this right here is is what I would feel the biggest tragedy about it all. Like, like you guys both have said. I mean, this game had the potential to be epic on this platform, but they just needed to take the time. And since they didn't, it's almost one of those things where it's like, are we happy we have it on the Saturn at all? You know, because we got all this uh, negative points to it, but we got a couple of bonus levels and an extra character. In my opinion, I don't. I don't think that the the downsides for the most part don't hinder the game for the most part. I mean, the only time it really hinders it is with the multiple enemies on screen. I personally enjoy the game thoroughly, and I think it's probably one of my favorite games I've ever played. But and the cover art is awesome. Yeah, it's (laughs) badass. 
So for for me, having played a little bit and only ever wanting the Saturn version, I, I don't plan on touching the actual PlayStation version. Um, I have to say that if this is if you want to experience this game, the definitive experience is either on the PlayStation or any of the ports that have come about from the PlayStation, like the Xbox Live Arcade version. When you get the, um, or the Direct X collection for the Vita, uh, sorry, the PSP as well. Yeah. Just, you know, playing it on the Saturn, if you've never played it and you want to try it out, um, it's already a $100 plus game, you know, so you could probably get the U.S. PlayStation version for cheaper and you can definitely get the U.S. version on uh, Xbox Live and probably uh, PSN for, you know, like like a $10 game right now. Yeah, um, I mean, it just makes sense just to play it on PlayStation. Yeah, so... For, for that level, I mean, thematically, it's Dracula. You, you almost can't get more Halloween than Dracula. Yeah. Um, so it, it's another one of those 10 out of 10 uh, for theme. Um, for overall value, I, I can't give this more than a 5. And I own it, and I love it, you know, because it's one of those, like, Saturn oddities. Not really an oddity, but it, 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 it's, it's so heartbreaking. You're saying uh, overall game score? My overall game score on the Saturn version of this is going to be a five. Um, okay, I would yeah. go higher than that. Yeah, I, I, think, I would go about seven personally. That's yeah, seven seventy-five percent. I here's the thing. I think to a layman, I, okay. Admittedly, I'm a I'm a geek, and I am a geek for audio and video, and I know I, I've looked at both versions and i've compared them and for people like us who are counting frames and we're looking at the number of pixels and we're looking at things like resolution and we also know the architecture of the system for me it's tough it's really tough just knowing like it just knowing that it's so technically inferior and yet those little you know you get those little prizes those little teasers like oh but there's maria you know it's it could be such a it could be the definitive version of the game but they just they just they dropped. It. They dropped the torch before they got to the lighting, um, you know. And 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 it was like, so that that makes it so bittersweet. That's what I feel. This game is bittersweet. But I think to somebody who's coming at it with a fresh pair of eyes, they've they're not coming to it from playing the PlayStation version. It's an enjoyable game, but they aren't going to, you know, they're going to get the same kind of lag that you're going to get from like Guardian Heroes when there's a ton of shit going on on the screen, you know, or Right. You know, any one of those games where it just like slows down to like 12 frames per second. Um, and that's going to be annoying. But I don't think people are really going to notice the nitpicky graphic stuff unless it's pointed out to them. So for that reason, I'm going to give it like a 75%. You know, it's a pass. It's a, like a C plus. Um, is that what a 75% is? It's like a C plus. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's a, it's a, it's playable beatable enjoyable but for me it's just a bittersweet a bittersweet pill to swallow you know what i think, I th- I think I'll, I'll i'm gonna boost mine up to an eight because overall while the game i mean they, they don't i mean even though i had a lot of lag issues on that higher end and the frame rate issues uh i personally i don't think there was anything that hindered me from enjoying it as much as i would have played on the playstation I, I mean, let's face it, if the PlayStation version didn't exist and we all received it back in 97 as is, uh, if anything, we would just um, gripe about, you know, frame. the slowdown and stuff like that. So it, it, it literally exists like Deep Fear exists in the shadow of Resident Evil, the original. This mm-hmm. game, unfortunately, will always be compared to its PlayStation counterpart. If, and because if we frame that, it... Oh, good. Well, just because that game is so close to godlike status, you know, in yeah. execution and in and in how it's held up over time, um, you know, that's that's where this game sits, you know, in in the shadow of that game. Sure, I I have to frame my rating, you know, in the context of because it's an overall, right? Like, not only are we comparing to the PlayStation version, but also the fact that the Saturn version's price is just extraordinarily expensive considering that it is an inferior port and that you know a good port is available for so cheap and that's that's kind of where it comes in for an overall perspective for me um i actually won't play the playstation version ever 
like I've I pick up this version a lot more often um, than I would uh, even the 360 version because I own both of those. Um, but it, if I look at the the entire picture, that's kind of where I'm at. All right, guys. So what do you guys think? Verdict on Dracula X? Keep it? Drop it? You know? I mean, I know there's all those technical issues and stuff, but is it worth and get, get it? Is it worth to get it on the Saturn, in your opinion? If Looking you're like buying I, original, I would have to say no. Really? Yeah. I mean, there's other platforms you can get it. You can get it for less than ten dollars. So, yeah, you know, if you're after an original copy, I can't say it's worth it. It's over a hundred dollars right now to get it. Right, like you copy. said. I mean, there's uh, there's the PlayStation version, which is much more affordable um and then you know you you've got it on uh on other remakes correct yeah they ported the playstation one to the xbox 360 arcade so cool yeah it just it doesn't seem like if we took all um, the playstation version out of the picture entirely my score for it which i you know i gave it like a five right so my score would go up phenomenally but if you factor in that the PlayStation version is cheaper, the PlayStation version has been ported. Um, it, it just doesn't seem worthwhile with all those technical aspect issues that we're seeing um, to to purchase the original copy. Play it on the Saturn by all means. Use other means besides uh, purchasing the original disc. It's just not worth that $100 to me. Yeah, because you're yeah. essentially paying $100 for a gimped version. You're paying a little, maybe a tiny bit more for those characters, but you're also getting all that gimped functionality. You can have a perfectly fine or, or perfectly fine version on the PlayStation 1. So I, I, agree. De I definitely agree that even though it's neat and there's a lot of cool features, and I did play it first on the Saturn, I think I would have enjoyed it more if I did the PlayStation 1. Es especially that I had to navigate the menu with Japanese, so mm -hmm. I probably could have saved myself a lot of time playing it with just playing the English version. Yeah, it's a collector's price for a collector's version. And, uh, you know, if that's what you're going for, um, all power to you. But, uh, but yeah, just to experience the game, go another route. Uh, but still, it's still an amazing game and a good Halloween game. It fits really well into, uh, into the scare factor and into the spirit of Halloween. I agree. All right, guys. So uh, let's hop on to our last and final game. The game that was voted uh, voted best Halloween game for the Sega Saturn and the Sega Saturn Collectors Group, which is, in, of course, uh, Mr. Bones. This is not to say that these are the only Halloween games. You know, we wanted to preface that there were a bunch of honorable mentions that we just don't have the time to get to. Um, yeah. And some of them were, were pretty terrible, and we'll probably rib them in another uh, video, but or sure. another podcast. But... Uh, yeah, Mr. Bones. Um, I, I want to, I want to take a swing for this one because this is uh, one of my personal favorites. Um, it's it's kind of cheesy. You know, full motion video in the beginning of this game is uh, uh, honestly it, it's Resident Evil cringeworthy bad. Um, the premise of the game is interesting. The gameplay itself is very unique. You don't. This is a Saturn exclusive. You know, you don't see this game anywhere else. And uh, I think that um, it was a, a hidden gem 20 years ago, or, or almost 20 years ago. And uh, today people finally have caught on you know, to this game. It's not everyone's cup of tea, but it is fantastic for the kind of gameplay it offers. Very uh, varied gameplay. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, the interesting, uh, Sega, they, they were the ones that, uh, approached Ed Anunziata of, uh, the Zono Incorporated and also Angel Studios, which, um, they're notable for having worked on, uh, Resident Evil 2 on the N64 and well, getting you know, all of that FMV. That. Yeah, they, they got all that FMV working on the N64 cart and, and uh, just smashing that game into a 64 meg RAM cart uh, or 64 meg ROM, but uh, megabyte. Sorry, 64 megabytes. Um, but anyway, no, they did a, they did an amazing job with that, and also the the Tony Hawk's games on the N64. And so um, they were involved in this game, and it was just very um, one of their things was just making games that were really 
you know, kind of pushed the boundaries of the system or did things that other games didn't do. And and this was, yeah, like like Kay is saying, it's a multi-genre game that kind of defies genre because it's just so varied. And, and I don't think one level is the same. Like every level is kind of a different genre of gameplay, be it, uh, or perspective too, like each each level kind of takes up a different pers- uh, viewpoint or perspective and the genres uh, range from action and platform to music and rhythm to puzzle and memorization. It's like a breakout clone kind of thing going on there for one of the levels and you know the, that and the fact that the soundtrack was composed um, by uh, guitarist Ronnie Montrose you know it's, it's got a lot Are going you serious? for it. Ronnie Montrose did that whole oh it's insane. Did the whole thing yeah and so um graphically i mean it's a really beautiful 2d game uh Pat, it's just you know it, that they motion capped him so whenever you see mr bones playing it's actually ronnie montrose that is exactly. insane yeah so there's a reason for you to like it patrick Do i love me <laughs> but, some uh, rock and roll metal i don't know the montrose technically rock and roll right or just rock Sure. Yeah. Straight rock. There's, you know, maybe some metal, metal influence, but, uh, but the thing is, um, the, the game just kind of defies, uh, you know, labeling classification. it. Uh, yeah, exactly. It kind of defies classification, which, uh, and the fact that it's a Sega exclusive, you know, published by Sega, um, and developed by a studio that has clout, you know, as we know, um, they're able to do good games and they didn't, uh, I don't think they half-assed it or phoned it in. I think that they did a really good job. I think that it just, it, it's one of those games that on a already failing console in the U.S., you know, people were just not willing to take a chance on it. They, um, it was too much of an unknown. Um, but how do you guys feel about it uh, fitting in with Halloween? I mean, aside from it being like a skeleton is your main character. I mean, I think it's a funny concept. The whole game's pretty 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 funny so i mean it's it's still a halloween but you know there's nothing halloween has to be 100 percent scary all the time i yeah, mean we have all those halloween sure. movies so i mean just the silliness factor alone and just the the theme it works well yeah you're, this is one of the things oh go ahead k you're a skeleton running through a graveyard running away from other skeletons i mean you literally <laughs> are the living horde. dead exactly so I mean, it's it's fitting, and you know, this is one of the games that I that I had wanted to include on like a polarizing uh, episode of games that people either love or hate. And it is one of those games that you know it, it's very polarizing. I don't really know anybody who's just like kind of in the middle about Mr. Bones. You know, you either you either really do love it, and it's more than a guilty pleasure. It's it's for a lot of people, it's like a really solid game, and then or or you just hate it, you know, because it's just not your thing, but. You know, um, before there were your, you know, there before there were your Mario Party games. You know, you um, or at least con- at the same time, you know, you had stuff like this, which would make a really good party game, really good, uh, a fun game to talk about. You know, um, and uh, it's one of those games that's punishingly difficult. So it's a controller passer, you know, because you're gonna die a lot, and probably more fun to to play with other people at this point. Mm. Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely a pretty interesting game, and I, I guess I noticed that with a lot of the Saturn stuff, is they had really interesting, unique, strange games that nobody really took a risk on. But well, you're a Dreamcast yeah. fan, right? Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. That's no surprise. But the thing is that with the Dreamcast, there's no games that were that had that thematic feel to it. The Dreamcast, while it was still, it, it still had some some quirks of the night the '90s and early 2000s. It didn't have that weird 2d slash 3d feel that the saturn or the, even the playstation had at times i mean that's like true i mean like i don't know if it's just me yeah but me but like the cg stuff like mr bones d things like that even resident evil had like a s- distinct 32-bit feel to it oh sure and i mean even the 64 had its own unique feel to it it's it's just really interesting especially especially the sound with all its weird uh you know uh, hidden gem games, but you look at the you look at a console like the Dreamcast, which you know uh, some would argue was up there. It's one of the greatest consoles of all time, and again, very Sega. You know they have a game about raising a pet fish, you know, or they have a game about you know like Choo Choo Rocket is crazy. 
um, Space Channel Five. Space Channel Five, but that's exactly the one I was thinking of. Okay, so you know, you you look at these games that are just so quintessentially Sega, and um, Mr. Bones is is right there. I mean, it you know for the Saturn, um, it's one of those crazy. It had it been marketed better, you know, more people would have n- taken notice of it and been like, "Wow, that's really weird," and hated it in spite of that. But uh, <laughs> they didn't even really market this game very well, so. It just kind of went unnoticed, and it just—it was one of those wrong place, wrong wrong time. Now, but, say, uh, do you think it would have succeeded if it was on the PlayStation, PlayStation uh, hardware as well? You know, backed by Sony with better ad campaign. Um, I'm sure they'd have found a way to sell it. Um, They're I don't know what do you think. Anti two D though, and this is they, true. Although this is all you know, beautiful, beautifully rendered graphics. It's still a two D game. Well, I mean, look at uh, look at Abe's Odyssey, and it's, essentially that's another 2D game. I mean, it had 3D cutscenes, but Very good try. Yeah. It's essentially I mean, I think, it's a 2D game. Yeah, I think I think on a platform that had you know better install base, um, there are people that appreciated 2D games, and I do think that it would have been would have done better uh, because I think that that's part of its failure is just attributed to the fact that the Saturn was pretty much already on its way out. Uh, when this game came so you have to think you know people who who had betted on the saturn and were going to stick with it you know uh, kind of had to focus their spending um you know on on uh games that they knew were going to pay off you know like shining force or um you know enemy zero is a little more high profile but you know it, mr bones just comes out of left field um, even now, you know, and I, like I said, yeah, I find a hard time just describing it. Um, just to say that it's a, you know, it's a multi-genre game that has a high-level difficulty, uh, two discs, some beautiful graphics. It's going to give you hours of gameplay, um, and whether or not you'll enjoy it is really just up to if if you have an open mind and you like games that kind of challenge your ability to classify them. Yeah, I just think overall that Mr. Bones was a victim of you know that bad box art phobia. Like, I mean, if you look at the box art, it's, I mean, it's because you don't like pre-rendered CGI. Well, a lot CGI. of people don't really like that, and it had I don't know. There's that vibe of it that you get when you look at it. I don't know if it's just me, I'm crazy, but it's like it looks like a mediocre game. It's more of a judge your book by your cover. It's not I'm not saying that's a bad game by any means. Or it's horrible from the get go, but. I mean, I you gotta think of customer perception. I mean, you're at a store. It's like, well, I can get Mr. Bones, like this risky, weird, EG looking game that looks cheesy. Or I can pick up something, you know, that looks cool as a cool, cool box art, something that's, you know, yeah, I hear pops, it. or an established I think, name. I think Clockwork Night kind of has the same thing going oh, on. Oh, yeah, here. absolutely. And I, I mean, I love it to death. I, I absolutely love Clockwork Night, but, um,. If I but were to yeah. look at this cover compared to like Johnny Bazooka Tone, like this cover wins. Oh I, sure, <laughs> I love it. I, I mean, I think the color choice is good. I think I, I think I'm not surprised that you don't like it, Patrick, because I know you have really gone completely the Japanese side of route of things, and so you are used to you know some pretty beautiful cover art for the Japanese games. So I can understand how it's off putting. Well, um, I mean, and it yeah. is. I mean, it's, a, it's the U.S. box art, you know. I mean, that is, it is what that is. Um, yeah. Undeniably, undeniably, that's a factor. It was a factor uh, back when these boxes were sh- sitting on the shelves, waiting to be bought or, you know, moved on to a a bargain bin or whatever. So, the Japanese art is actually stranger. I think it, it is strange. It, you know, that's that's the other thing is the the when you'd had it when you had like an American made game. The Japanese sometimes just the way that they would try to sell it, it just made no sense. Like, look at Mass Destruction on the cover; it's just like a tree, you know. And I mean, it's a tank game. I so, so I don't know. the The Japanese had a weird way of trying to sell American games because things were lost in translation, you know. But uh, I, I just think that the Japanese knew what they were doing with the aesthetics and the logos. I mean, I mean, if you look at games covers now, it sort of has that same vibe to it especially with some of those uh the the, the popping color games i mean like uh like when um mario uh uh sorry sonic mania came out it had oh, yeah. that sort of unique 
colored looking, you know, cool design. I mean, that harken at... back to their old 90s designs with all the geometric shapes and colors. And... Yeah, and it, it looks really beautiful. I mean, I mean I'll, oh, you know, yeah. I'm looking at a Johnny Bazooka tone. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the Japanese cover. It, it had, like, you know, a good layout, good big, you know, colorful logo. It just asked, but... I mean, as a graphic designer, I mean, you have to admit that, you know... I mean, I mean oh, do you sure. agree with me? So you don't have to oh, agree, sure. but do you? No, I mean, I, I absolutely, I, I, you know, I think that uh, that that doesn't say anything of the the gameplay. But I mean, it's no surprise to anybody that uh, I mean, we all know that the U.S. marketing was pretty bad, and even U.S. publishing, and um, just at the time, the whole attitude thing that um, they just kind of milked to death. It, it started out in the late '80s, early '90s, and. Uh, Sega just they really really beat that horse to death yeah, much long after it was it had really outlasted its usefulness and and people had moved on and 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 we weren't that gullible you know to be uh you know tricked into buying a game based on you know some you know promise that it that it was going to be cool or have attitude you know we knew at that point um people were definitely focusing on gameplay and, and control you know not just graphics um but i think i think mr bones is a solid game and i know k <laughs> does <laughs> sorry we're gonna come a little bit off the topic no but... yeah we went we went a little off topic but that's okay i mean um everything you're talking about goes into you know how it was perceived at the time and i know even how it's perceived now you know it might be one of those games um, and that's why we're doing this. You know, it might be one of those games that you see on eBay or you see it on lists and you pass it up, you know, just mentally. You kind of put it on your, you know, just forget about that one. Um, and so we're telling you, you know, check it out because uh, you might actually find yourself surprised. Yeah, I definitely came into it with a, a negative attitude because it, it just looked awful. The CGI rendered looked really bad, but I played it for a little bit and it was, it was actually... Uh, quite fun for what it was. Wow! Yeah. <laughs> Yay! Yay! <laughs> we mean, converted him. No. I well, I yeah, I, I came into it very negative. But... Yeah, if you want to play a bad game, play the crow. <laughs> Ouch! No, we won't go there. We won't go there. Uh, All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. So, um, so for, score for those. Yeah, we gotta do score. We also have to talk a little bit about um, the different regions. This is uh, one of the harder to find PAL region games. So, price wise, Mr. Bones has been climbing in the last few years. Uh, I just looked over on eBay um, for context. This is at the uh, end of October uh, 2017, and I see a complete copy listed at uh, being around $70. For us i uh, see another one about 60. wow oh i didn't know it was that much for the us i thought it was like 40 or through like 30. yeah me too yeah no it mr bones this is the reason and i feel anyway this is the reason that it won our poll in spite of you know we have what we would consider perfect 10 thematically as well as gameplay wise out of like resident evil or house of the dead um you know despite its issues uh mr bones has been climbing in popularity it has gained a real cult following and I mean, I don't remember the last look at the poll, but um, you know, it's still Mr. Bones. But was it wasn't it like Mr. Bones by a long shot? You know, like, uh, like Resident like, Evil was. Was it climbing? I, I think people started reallocating uh, their votes to. They started backing, you know, the stronger mm -hmm. opponents, and I know Resident Evil came out, you know, just behind Mr. Bones. But there were it was a it was up by a few votes, so it when was I a last solid win. At it, like right before PRGE was the last time I looked at that poll and Mr. Bones had it solidly like just mopping the floor with everyone else. True. So, but I yeah, think I mean, people, yeah. Uh, thematically, I, I give this game probably an eight out of 10. I mean, it deals with the dead. You can't really get much more Halloween than that. Um, True. And there's a great, you're running through a graveyard. You're running through a graveyard. And, uh, there are definite moments of tenseness where you're hopping over those gravestones and tripping up and there's like a horde of skeleton there's like a skeleton army coming after you coming after you and like running as if they were like they're skeleton zombies basically oh yeah mind oh yeah how do you have a mind control over a, a skeleton but you know you do <laughs> right 
Um, mm. Mad scientist. I mean, it all kind of fall, feels thematically for me about an eight, maybe a nine. Yeah, I I, I agree. Definitely, I, I definitely agree with that. Very eight or nine. Value, uh, overall, you know, score for me. This game gets a ten because it's um, Saturn specific, Saturn unique. Uh, the gameplay is varied across, you know, once you get past that first level or two, you start to realize you're not going to be playing the exact same game every single time, like every single level. There, that repetitiveness that normally leads to, um, you know, a lack of replayability just isn't there for this game. It really only facing, you know, a, a challenge curve over anything else. Exactly. I think people die so much in that first level, they just assume, oh, is it going to be this you know for the rest of the game and then but if you can get over that that learning curve um you know there's a whole lot of game there and uh honestly as a as a collector it's it's a saturn exclusive so i feel kind of like it's a must own yeah i would i I, I don't know that i would give it a 10. i mean i think i would maybe give it like an 85 percent or 90 uh to be generous um i mean but it is two discs it's a saturn exclusive it's got great music it's got good graphics um, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty full package. So uh, it's up there. Yeah. In terms of value, I'm kind of, kind of in the middle. I mean, while it was, it was kind of neat, I don't really, I didn't really think it was that great of a game. And mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it was, it was pretty fun. I admit, but I mean, there's a bunch of games you'd probably get over that and still enjoy. And especially you know it's a $70 game, that's a little bit of a hard pill to swallow. I was not aware. I was not aware that it had climbed that much, so that definitely... Well, at the time we were talking, I mean, it might be a dollar when you listen to this for some reason. <laughs> sure. But yeah, I'm just but... saying, at $70, though, I mean, there's a ton you can get for the Saturn that's a lot better, a lot better value. I think Resident Evil is about 70 now for that as well, so... I do think that's uh, a much yeah, better game. Pick between those two games, yeah. You know, the, the truth is if you're not super open-minded or you don't want a game, you're not into quirky games, I mean, because there's, it's it's a quirky game to some degree. I think if you're, you like, you know, your mainstream fighters, you're not into kind of like those quirky fighters. Um, I would say stick with games, you know, that are a little bit more predictable, like Resident Evil. Um, but if you're looking for something that might surprise you, if, you, if you're, open-minded and you're interested in quirky games um this is a good game it's not one of those you know trashy you know crap games that that also happens to be quirky it's actually pretty darn good and uh i don't think you're going to be disappointed adding it to your collection i can agree for, with that for contrast um i put out the first uh cib which is what i was comparing for um uh mr bones the first cib for Resident Evil is ninety dollars right now. Okay, twenty dollars more. I mean, it's to be honest, I'd, I'd still probably pay that. Sure, but uh, I, don't and, know. I mean, I wouldn't blame you either. I mean, Resident Evil, solid Capcom game, and uh, and so I think I think it comes down to that: what kind of gamer are you? Um, you, you probably know the answer to that. So, oh, well, I'm looking at the sold ones, and it looks like it's about 40, 40 bucks. 50 60 so i guess that's a little bit better pill to swallow but yeah yeah like i mean I, if you and if you go for the discs too i mean yeah and you can you always just, just the burn it if you want this yeah, is true i mean that's the great equalizer for saturn right now is you know w with minimal cost to entry you can burn pretty much any game just make sure you use good media mm -hmm. so for all of you guys out there that are you know using pseudo or ria or uh, even a swap method, and you're looking for a good game to play on Halloween. Um, this this is a good bet. Um, you know, we we've mentioned a lot of games here, um, and I don't think any of the ones that we've mentioned you could really go wrong with. So, you know, if you're looking at your collection or your backlog, and you just don't know what to grab for Halloween, um, you know, take one of these recommendations and. Uh, and if you're if you're at a party, you know, bring them to a party and you know show some people some crazy Saturn games they may never have heard of, you know. So yeah, definitely. Uh, I think it's a good good solid choice. Uh, yeah, but uh, that was a good list, guys. Any did you guys, guys want to? Did you guys want to throw out any last minute uh, dishonorable mentions? I know we I mentioned the crow, and I, uh, 
I almost uh, have to since it's been like my uh, call sign or gamer tag or whatever for the longest time. Is that um, where that comes from? Originally, uh, like I'm a, a big fan of uh, the mythos around the crow. Cool. <laughs> um, excuse me. And uh, I, I also like uh, you know, the double meaning behind it, you know, the wor- the use of the word murder in that. But uh, that's off topic. I mean, short, sweet, to the point. <laughs> I love sure. the film series. I love the mythos behind it. Don't pick up the Crow City of Angels for the Sega Saturn. It's horrible. It is god awful. And for the yeah. PlayStation, it's 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 <laughs> equally bad. <laughs> yeah, at least for the PlayStation, it's cheap. <laughs> oh yeah, but I it, mean, it's cheap either way. It's, it's cheap. Well, it started raising in price. Um, I mean, I guess everything in Saturn kind of rose in price a little bit better than, you know, if, if you have a crap title on the PlayStation, you can expect to play, uh, pay crap prices. Yeah, this on game is Saturn, scary for the wrong reasons. It's just <laughs> scary to play. It's so bad. It's that bad. And I, re- I, I really tried to like this one just because of that affinity for that mythos. I, I want a good Crow game, you know? Mm-hmm. That might happen one of these days, but who knows? All right. Well, I just want to throw out, um, I, I, I also love me some 2D platforming, and I love the, the original Gex. And I know you start out that game in a, in a cemetery, and so, you know, there's monsters, and, and there's Halloween music. And um, I, also included, uh, I also included some of the music from, from that cemetery level in this podcast episode, along with uh, uh, Weevil Dead 2 from, from Bug 2, which I also think is a really cool, you know, halloween level though those games don't qualify completely as halloween games uh those are those are fun little uh, platforming you know halloween platforming levels so i wanted to throw those out as kind of little honorable mentions but uh but not complete games that we could really complete uh i could completely endorse in the list yeah how about you patrick you got any uh you want to throw out there mm, you know there's really no uh bad horror games I play. I'm, I sort of, uh, especially with the years going on, and I'm sort of a newer collector to it, there's really nothing that uh, I really have that's that's god-awful. I mean, there. I mean, and there's not really much Halloween base that's on the, se- the se- sound to begin with. Yeah, yeah there's more if you look in the Japanese. And, you know, there's like the Dark Seed games and Phantasmagoria and you know, if there's a few more things if you look at the Japanese library, because of course Jap- Japanese, they're they like their horror, you know. Yes, um, for sure. But uh, but you're right. Even even then, it's slim compared to like the PlayStation library. So, but I think we got. I think we picked a pretty solid uh, group of games. So now, there's something for everybody here. For for anyone who's sitting there and, and itching about ones we didn't talk about, yeah, we we really didn't talk about a lot of the more obscure. Like he was mentioning Phantasmagoria. Um, we didn't really insult. yeah like talk about the Japanese ones. There are ones we we flat out just didn't pop into the list. Um, Mansion of the Hidden Souls we just didn't have time to talk about. Uh, Casper. Well, yeah, Casper. We had uh, Crypt Killer. Uh, or Corpse oh Killer. sure, yeah. Wait, Corpse, Corpse Killer. Killer was on Saturn. Yeah. Oh yeah, a special oh. edition, graveyard edition. Oh well, then I picked that one for my worst game because that game fucking sucks. <laughs> it sure does, but that one's even going up now. Oh man. Yeah, I'm yeah. learning more things about the Saturn every day, so oh, sure. now that I know on that, now I have my dishonorable mention, which is that game, because... <laughs> Corpse Killer Graveyard Corpse Killer. Edition. Go yeah. play it. Go. Right. It should have <laughs> stayed in the graveyard. Shoot yourself between but the I'm eyes. That, uh, that justifier. Hey, man. We're going to go shoot up some zombies <laughs> with the terrible Jamaican accent. But yeah, so we, I'm sure that there's probably something that we missed. Um, and please let us know. Right? We have a Q&A section in our Facebook page to interact with us and give us uh, questions. We didn't really get to much of the questions this time around. This was kind of a special show. Um, but uh, thanks for hanging out with us for however long this was. And we hope you have a happy Halloween. A happy Halloween. Don't get too spooked. And, and go enjoy some Halloween video gameplay uh, for your for your Halloween. Exactly. See you later, guys. As always, you must play Sega Saturn.